Okay, so we're live on the air. Um, I was planning a debate with someone uh, tonight, and however, sadly, they've had to uh, drop out uh, due to technical issues. So instead, we've got a nice impromptu debate. Um, not debate, sorry, a stream with um, some lovely people. Tonight with us, we have Ted Chires, we've got Piper, we've got Music Man Mike, otherwise known as Michael Rowlands, and Luna Veg, otherwise known as Ashley. How are you all, everyone? I'm very good, thanks. Excellent to hear, Ted. How about the rest of you? How are you? Um, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm good. I was going to say something really negative, but I couldn't think of it on the spot. So, yeah, I'm great. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, just really hot. It's like, uh, I don't know, when, while I was away, I think Hastings relocated to the surface of the sun or something. So, um, I got back. <laughs> Excellent. And, yeah. Mm. And, 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 and I imagine it's um, warm in uh, the um, southern hemisphere at the moment, given it's like what? Um, yeah, I think we're in the summer. I think the summer at the moment, um, which I suppose is why it's hot. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. Where do you, where, uh, Michael, where do you live? Right, I, if you don't mind me. I, I live in. I live in um in Hawke's Bay in New Zealand. Oh, New Zealand. Okay. Oh yeah, I was yeah, going yeah, to yeah. say that um Michael is a Kiwi. Hi. I've had this um this talk with a lot of people because like a lot of Americans know the fruit as a kiwi. They're like, oh, it's a kiwi, and then I tell them about the bird, and they're like, um, oh, I, like I immediately yeah. knew that um the bird or that kiwi was after the bird and not the fruit. <laughs> Yeah, yeah well, I know the. The, yeah, the bird know the actually bird looks fruit. like the fruit. Yeah, it does. Actually. Yeah, it does actually. <laughs> I never actually I know. That. I, knew about the bird. I wonder if they're green on the inside. <laughs> I knew Probably about not. the bird because when I was a kid, I used to like, um, like I was big into like learning about animal stuff, which most kids are. But I, like, I was like nerdy about it. Like, I used to read a lot of books and stuff. And so, as a result, like I know a lot of obscure animals like that. I guess we um here in New Zealand we used to have um there used to be a, a big bird like a I, it was kind of like an ostrich but same kind of uh, color as the kiwi. Emu? What's that? Was it an emu? Uh, no, they called it. A, it was called a moor, and and they're they're big. They're they're, oh. uh, they're extinct. They're extinct now, um, unfortunately. But oh they, yeah. <laughs> so. You imagine a, you imagine an ostrich, how big an ostrich is. These things were bigger than that. And then we also used to have a giant eagle that hunted those. So that's uh, <laughs> kind of terrifying. Oh but we, they're all I know they're most extinct now, um, unfortunately. But um, yeah, pretty pretty incredible. <laughs> and uh, whilst we were uh, talking about the uh, origin of the word kiwi to describe a New Zealander, um, two new people joined the live chat. So uh, say hello to uh, Aircraft Sparky and American Anarchist. How are you both? Hi. I'm doing well, thank you. Excellent. How about you, Thanks. Anarchist? If they're there. I think she's uh, muted. Has his mic muted. Hi. Um, hey, um, oh, shit. <laughs> I was basically yeah. monologuing, and then I heard someone say that my mic was muted. Not for <laughs> <us>. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Josh Bucky, are you able to, like, green screen some cool special effects and behind you while you're there? Uh, yeah, when I do my live streams on uh, Wednesday nights uh, at 8 Central U.S. Standard Time, I, uh, uh, yes, I have a virtual studio where I bring guests up and everything. So uh, That's really cool. Yeah, what it's, uh, it's do you use broadcasting software, dude? I feel like I I've been uh, fast already. Like my technolo technology is like surpassing the standards on this channel. Like green <laughs> Uh, honestly, I started out with just an American flag as my background, and I got a little bored with it. Um, yeah. So now I, I use green screens through OBS. It, it, it actually yeah. changes production quality a whole lot when you're streaming. So does OBS have a, have a green screen option, does it? Because I use OBS yes. as well. Yes. Uh, um, okay, it does cool. go through the, uh, chroma, <laughs> the chroma filters and pick okay. a color. Okay. That works. Okay, I'm gonna have to start doing them. That's cool. Yeah, I like OBS. I use it a lot. 
So also uh, Streamlabs has an OBS style uh, program associated with them that you can use through the website. I haven't tried it yet, but I've heard good things about it. That's cool. We're getting an echo from somewhere again. Um, oh, perhaps like seven of us. I hope it's could not be. for me. Generally, uh, oh, generally I... the way that we do it on, on other live streams and stuff, we um, if you're not talking, go ahead and mute yourself, and then and then it sort of cuts out any echoes. And then if you want to talk, then just un unmute. It's usually how it works okay. pretty well, unless you've got headphones. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty good idea. I just have to remember to do it. Um, and oh. we now have our eighth guest, Lonely Wolf. Hi. Hey, y'all. Uh, Lonely Wolf, someone who I am very familiar with and who is a pretty frequent flyer on my channel. <laughs> on a lot of channels. Yeah. yeah. Representing the Southern Hemisphere. Yeah, <laughs> you <laughs> and um, Roland. Uh, certainly. I think I was the one who was here representing first, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but Troy is Real. way cooler than you are, Mike. Oh, now, now Mike oh, plays guitar. You've oh, got to wow. give him that. Oh, I see how it is. <laughs> he is well, a Kiwi, but don't hold that against him. That, that, that was very rude, Rose. Very rude. I mean, <laughs> Troy knows math very well. Uh, that's my area of... Uh, I, I'm showing that I'm a nerd, but, you know, that that's well, what I think... Cool people should be judged by is how well they know math. <laughs> the old people. Like so. um, mm. Australia beat them in the cricket. So I mean, we've got that. Well, I mean, <laughs> I've got. And we beat Australia in the cricket. So. A guitar. You didn't. I, uh, I don't know how to play it, but I've got it. Australia and I've got a ponytail, so. I, I am the coolest one in this chat. <laughs> <laughs> so do we have a um, do we have a, a topic that we would want rather than just? I have a pony. <laughs> your argument is invalid. <laughs> uh, I I also have a bunch of those plushies, but like they're all on my bed. Actually, no, there's two right here. I could show it, I, but I don't want to turn my camera on. So. I I yeah. mean I have a Pegasus um, stuffed animal that I wanted an arcade. <laughs> No, nah, see, what you gotta do is you gotta you gotta be like me, and you gotta get like, like, three or four of them on eBay, and pay like ten dollars. Gotta do that. See, we got two animals here. Like, we got we got Rose's animal, and you got like mine, and like his is like a badass kind of one. Mine's kind of the plushy, <laughs> friendly. Hers. Got a bird on his shoulder. <laughs> uh. Um, but Ashley, you mentioned you had something to talk about, so uh, take it away. Oh, uh, yes, yes. So, you see, uh, today on Twitter, um, I was searching the Twitters like I do sometimes, and I actually began this rather interesting exchange with one Paul Elam. I thought too. <laughs> oh, yes. This was, this was rich. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the, the tweets there. You could um, maybe show us on the yeah. screenshot. Um. Well, actually, they're on my phone. Um, fortunately, I, can, I, I don't I really know. Share them. I can share them if you like. Hold on. Uh, sure. Um, okay. So, started with these. What was the first one? Uh. Fuck. 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 Yeah, okay, here we go. I got, I got the there we go. So I can do that. Okay, there we go. There we yep. go. Um, the first one was like, oh fuck, oh. My, my computer. Is... I need to fix my computer. It's not plugged in. And it's running low on power. If you um, oh, and if you click on yeah, my little like... thingy, you yeah, cool. So that's the that's the original tweet, right? Yeah, that's the original <laughs> tweet where um. <laughs> I don't even think, yeah, he just, um, he was whining because some, some people were talking about toxic masculinity and how it is kind of related to these mass shootings. And I, I quote tweeted it because that's what I do sometimes when horrible people say stupid things. Uh, I, and I quote tweeted it and repeated this, this meme that it comes from the Simpsons. Uh, if you guys don't get it. You can Google it. 
Um, <laughs> I said I quote tweeted it saying, "Old man continues shaking his fists at clouds." <laughs> <laughs> Simpsons reference, essentially. Yeah. Yes. I mean, yes. My one. I've only ever had one exchange with him before. Like he blocked my ass. Oh. Uh, and it was a very weird one. I fucking liked the Dick Coughlin video, which was a really fucking. It, it was a satire video called um, "A Message for Ad and Ear for Men." <laughs> and. Fucking Paul Elam thought that I was sharing it, and he's like, oh, I'm gonna get to that video. And then basically he, like, blocked me for sharing a video mocking him. Okay, 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 but it, 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 it gets better. Um, okay, um... <laughs> but it was literally what? like, how do I get myself out of the fuck zone? Okay, so the first thing... The first thing this that he does is he quote tweets my tweet, my my quote tweet. It's like quote tweet section. Fuck, where is it? Um. Um. Oh, where is it? Where is it? Exception. That's an Owen McDonald classic. If you've <laughs> ever like, if you've ever <laughs> seen the arguments between Owen McDonald and other people on Twitter. Oh, Owen. <laughs> okay, so the first so the first thing is that he 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 quote tweets my tweet and says close at airheads as in he's shaking his fist at airheads. Um yeah, sure Jan. Um then one of his fangirls he ha he has fangirls, I I don't know how that happens. Um accusing me accuses me of being ageist and sexist. Uh, and I and I said to her, I take it you don't watch The Simpsons. Then Paul says, <laughs> then Paul says to me, I take it you watch a lot of TV. To which I say, not really. I take it. I take it you don't read much. Wait, so he thought. To which I he says to you watch a lot. He thought I take it you watch a lot of TV was like a good like comeback. I guess. <laughs> well, I mean, it seems like his. He, it seems like his implication that he was trying to go for is like, oh, you must watch a lot of TV. You must be very lonely, even though a lot of people watch a lot of TV. I don't it even. Basically, I don't it even was, know. It seems like trying. this weird, like, kind of like, oh, you, you know, you can't get a man to fuck you, so you watch a lot of TV, like. Um, that's what right. I think was probably like what I think that it was probably like something convoluted like that, knowing Polly Lynn. something, something stupid. But it, he even, goes on. I don't, even know, I don't even know what like the point of that comeback was. To be honest, like I can't, I can't discern. He can't let any, he can't like, let, actual. He can't, let, he can't let the mean lady have the last word. But anyway, he says he says you're a TV oh, yeah, clone. Using lines from TV shows to try to appear pithy in the place of real arguments. No shame in it, Cupcake. Embrace your true self right there on the sofa. Cupcake? What? Yes. Gr yes, gross. <laughs> and I, to which I said, first of all, don't call me Cupcake. Secondly, none of your bio is worth taking seriously. Again, you seemingly don't even get what toxic masculinity refers to. Okay, so then he says, "No, cupcake. This is not how it works." Again, gross. You you don't get to toss ad hom my way, then dictate what I can call you in response. Secondly, if none of my bio is worth taking seriously, you can prove that by shutting up and going away. Now run along. <laughs> and it's just <laughs> all the rest of this I'm gonna take this shit really personally. Oh yeah, I forgot how mean you were. Rez is talk is like, oh you're so mean. Yes, the, um, I I'm oh. yes I, I'm so evil because I because I I I, 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 t I tell mean I tell mean people that they're mean and I'm not particularly gentle about it. I do love how um it, like Paul Liam sounds like some cartoon villain here. Like oh run along cupcake. Like, run around, little girl. Run along. So, so, it sounds almost like a really like cliche D and D session. Like you just have the 
the thing, villain, the thing like, I was gonna say was that like he like his tweets, his style of tweeting reminds me of like old people on Facebook. He is um, an old person on Twitter. <laughs> he's like, <laughs> God, that's so ageist. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, uh, I find Who put him in charge of men's welfare? I mean, okay, so talking over each other. Sorry. So it as much as I like to say it, as much as, as much as I'd like to say it ended there, it didn't because I re- because I I couldn't let it end there because I don't know why. Maybe I'm a masochist. I I, re- I quote tweeted it and I said I quote tweeted that last comment of his and I said this man just needs a beating from some very large women. It was. Um, I'm happy to um, oblige. You would like to um, you would like to be one of the very large women to beat him. I mean, I'm a very large woman. Okay, and um, two hundred two hundred thirty so pounds and six feet tall. I'm not. Skinny. <laughs> okay, Sorry, so bro, your he... voice doesn't match. It's fine. Fair enough. Okay, so um, but he but could then he he couldn't let it end there either. So he quote tweeted me and said, "And where on earth can we find obese, bovine ob- women who advocate violence against men they disagree with?" That's easy. Any feminist group. In fact, I'm talking to one right now. Tell, tell me, Cupcake, how much do you weigh? <laughs> and then three it's laughing good. emojis. I don't, know if, I don't know if Paul Elam has ever looked like in the mirror, but um, like him with- like calling out other people's weight is not like the most smart tactic on his uh, part. Yeah, that's like War Corp being like this fat, ugly feminist. Uh, like, I don't, I don't know, know, maybe he slimmed down, but the last time I've seen like a picture of Pauly Lam, he had a pretty, uh, also, he had a pretty yeah, big yeah. dad going on. Yeah, again, bovine. Like, it's, <laughs> his language is so like, if he put his mind to like a different field, he could probably be like a really good writer. But no, instead, he's spending his time like screaming at people who. Uh, Move with me, work. people. Move. <laughs> Move. I am cow. Hear me move. I weigh twice as much as you, and I look good on the barbecue. Um, thank you, my, my uh, thank you, arrogant worms, for that song. Okay. Um. So, uh, so mean, then I, I like, quote. I disagree with the um, looking good on the barbecue thing, but other than that, that yeah, you know, you know, I won't argue friends that. Not, friends not, friends not food, but um, you don't so then I salad. You don't make friends with salad. You don't make friends with salad. <laughs> Shut Erica up, Mike. Also, <laughs> Erica Mike also has another song saying that con- bitch food constitutes murder, but I will stop there. <laughs> okay, so of course I went on. And I quote tweeted him, and I said, "Simple, come get, come get introduced to roller derby the the hard way. Be sure to bring a mouth guard, angel face." And then I added three kissing, kiss, kissing emojis. Angel face, he is divine. I, I, no, yeah, I guess so. Angels could look like most anything. Keep keep, keep in mind that Lucifer was an angel too. Oh yeah, good point. good point. I mean, to be fair, I mean, if you look at the Bible, you could argue that Lucifer was the only angel that ever actually did anything good for humanity. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> okay, so then like, he um, apparently made. Apparently, he did. He didn't quote tweet me, but he said to me. He said to me. He saw an actual picture of my face, and he said. And. He said, and Woo wee! Just saw your pick. A disgusting porker, just like I thought. Tell you what, cupcake. I, I'm gonna t- help you out here. It's 
It's not the fat, it's the carbs. <sighs> okay, I, I so... Meeting... okay, so... Fucking, if Polly Alam, like, if I had seen that, I'd been like... Like, oh, sweetie, you criticizing people for how they look. If you only knew what irony meant. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, Rose, at this point, the gloves were off, and I was just like, okay, fine, all bets are off. So I quote tweeted that, and I said, I'm a disgusting porker. Yeah, that's so heartbreaking come from, coming from a guy who looks like... Who looks like the creepy neighbor from Home Alone if he actually were, was a crazy shovel murderer. <laughs> maybe maybe don't comment on other people's looks until you lose the windowless van look. Oh now come on. Let's be let's be fair here, because driving around in a windowless van with free candy and puppy spray painted on the side is a great way to pass time. Do you speak from experience? Uh, well yes. <laughs> How do you think I met my daddy? Come on. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god, that... you guys. So, uh, so like, I, I, I feel I about that joke. Him as well because I thought that it was kind of stupid that Paul Al uh, Paulie Alam was um was calling people bigoted for a bunch of reasons. One of them was um was the fact that he seemed to think that calling out toxic masculinity makes you bigoted for some reason. Uh, I assume the reason is because he doesn't actually know what toxic masculinity um, refers to. Um, generally, these kind of people think that it means that all masculinity is toxic, which is wrong. Um, so, uh, so there was that bit which I thought was stupid, and then I went ahead and um, found just easily enough a, um, a tweet from from Paulie Lum uh, being a misogynistic piece of shit, and you know oh, the irony of of him doing that. Um, so, and it's also kind That's of funny because more recently during on, on Twitter at the moment, um, the whole Black Panther thing has been a thing. And so all of these um, white supremacist idiots are, are complaining about the fact that, that that Black Panther is apparently a black supremacist film because it's got mm. black people in it. No, that isn't why. Now, that isn't why, Mike. Um, to be anyway, honest, the reason why is because Wakanda is the outright, outright wet dream with dark skin. That's all it is. So what See what had happened uh, was Wakanda is the alt white alt right wet dream. It what, is what essentially is the, the only state. So what's the what's the well, Wakanda? Okay, in Wakanda they do not allow any type of immigrants whatsoever. Uh -huh. You can only be black. I uh -huh. mean, essentially, it is an ethno state. So yes, it's an alt alt right wet dream. But because the skin is dark, people give it a pass. That was what I the see. alt right were saying. That was what the alt right were saying. Is that like oh. Yeah. It, it's just, I mean, to be honest, you know, I'm not going to take the alt right seriously on what the actual thing of the film was because what, <laughs> I mean, no, I'm not getting that from the alt right. They legitimately twist everything to fit their agenda. So I, I, I mean, I'd have to watch uh, the film myself to see. It's uh, uh, really it interesting. Exactly. The movie itself was interesting. It wasn't bad, but it was interesting. It, yeah, it was. I mean, no spoilers. No, no spoilers. No, no spoilers. I'm. Yeah, no, I haven't seen it either, but like people were complaining about it before it even I'm came gonna out. I'm going to see it um, soon. It had a majority of black people. So it's like, it looks, mm, it looks you know, very pretty. It does look yeah. very pretty. I, but it just seems to me people are trying to find, it, uh, find problems with the movie. Um, it, honestly, I can't wait to see it, and then I also can't wait to see Infinity War. Um, Avengers Infinity War. Yeah. The whole uh, toxic masculinity thing, I'm assuming this is a, in uh, association with the recent shooting that happened at the school? Yeah. yeah. Okay, now, uh, this is my question, and, and I, okay, I'm not a feminist, I, I'm not a liberal, I'm, I'm a conservative libertarian. Okay, I try to talk to everyone, but my question is, how is that shooting related to toxic masculinity when a dude was too much of, well, not even man enough to really address this shit head on? With his fist, he had to engage with a a firearm. I mean, really, there's nothing manly about shooting unarmed people. Isn't mm. isn't the use of firearms and violence and a, a, a masculine thing? It's the whole that's, that's yeah. kind of the whole point. Isn't yeah. It? Well, it's also a sign of weakness. I mean, it takes a bigger man to walk away from things than it does to just <laughs> and go and kill everything. I mean, no, but, uh, I mean, this might mm. also just be because the um. You know, the term toxic masculinity, I feel, sometimes just doesn't get explained. And, you know, that's kind of what a lot of 
people like that can like capitalize on. But um, fuck, 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 But basically, the term toxic masculinity, at least um, how it was originally coined, was meant to refer to um, more toxic behaviors taught mm. to men, and not implying that there's like something inherently toxic about men, or even that like it's really manly it was yeah. more to talk about like you know teaching people that like violence is how you deal with your problems well okay but so like, if you look at um, um, if you look at cases, if you look at the violence or bottling it in if you yeah, look at yeah. the uh, structure of the like phrase i mean like toxic is the adjective and masculinity is the noun like with anything you can put an adjective toxic in front of any noun and uh, it doesn't mean the noun is now inherently entirely toxic. It just means that this element. So an example of, a, an example of how um, masculinity um, relates to mass shooting. If you look at um, if you look at Elliot Roger, which everyone kind of knows about, right? Um, Elliot Roger felt entitled um, to affection and and attention from women. Um, that is born out of a of a of a, to a toxic aspect of masculinity, and so he took it upon himself to punish people for the fact that he wasn't getting what he felt entitled. to. So in in that uh, particular case, you could argue that that toxic masculinity had um, had quite a big effect, uh, and, and in fact was much of a reason why the thing mm. happened. Now you can go ahead and and assess. I mean, we don't know a lot about this dude. We kind kind of do. a lot of people are blaming mental illness, and a lot of people blaming this and the other thing. But surely you can look at the thing and see that an aspect of it, and something that connects a lot of the mass shooting, is in fact um, a Toxic aspects of masculinity. Yeah, men who are taught essentially that the only way to address their emotions is through violence. And you can sort of see a bit of an inter intersectionality between that and also in race as well. Like the idea that um, white men are sort of being suppressed by the system and stuff, and they have to take their anger out on to groups who aren't white men, like uh, women, like um, ethnicities, like we saw in uh, with the ideas behind what the shooter was. You know, sort of thinking like if you look at the group chat season, he says some pretty horrific stuff about black people, about Mexicans, about LGBT. which is hilarious because he's Mexican himself. Well, he's got a um, Spanish surname, but that's quite common. In no, 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 his yeah, Spanish surname is from his father. He, uh, even though he was adopted, he kept his father's name. Um, yeah, and the whole like the whole what, white what, nationalist what's thing that he. To do with it? Pardon? What's the Mexican this stuff to do with? Uh well, his name his name is Nicholas de Jesus Cruz. Okay. He, so he was adopted. He was adopted by a white family. Um, but the the when I think it was Time that came out with the article said that he was working with white supremacists or whatever or no it was the AP that 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 pushed that. Uh, basically, they got trolled by 4chan. So journalists okay. do your due hmm. diligence. Actually, um, actually verify things. Don't find um, people who are just out looking for pub publicity, be it good, bad, or indifferent. Um, so the AP and a lot of news organizations have gotten egg on their face. Now Now the today's narrative is the R NRA taught this child how to kill people, do mass murders. Well, no, the NRA gave a $10,000 grant to the JROTC group that he belonged to at the school prior to him being um, kicked out. Um, expelled from that school in fact one of his people on that same rifle team that received some of that money from that grant given to the jrotc uh basically died trying to protect one of their classmates so really the whole nra thing is a non sequitur too it's just it's just a series of of really bad I don't think the nra is necessarily a, a, a non sequitur thing they they have a huge influence over the um over the policies that they yeah. go into um, exactly, but to say that they um, they specifically no, 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 funded no, 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 his training is where I'm is saying. It. Yeah, we yeah, were no, talking that's about fine, um, but, but we don't necessarily need to talk about that. We can talk about the NRA's overall influence on um, gun violence in America, and and I think that it's definitely something that needs to be talked about because um, I don't know this happens again and again and again. Like people saying what 28, 28 or thirty, I don't know, somewhere, somewhere between twenty five and thirty mass shootings or or the gun related thingamajiggies happened in America since the beginning of this year. 
Okay, it's, well, it's um, there was a report that came out that said that there's been 18 school shootings uh, mm -hmm. that's happened since January 1st of 2018. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. There has been 18 incidences with firearms at school shootings. What people do not know is um, a lot of these weren't really like, oh, attacks on the school or anything. Uh, one was a stray bullet shot does off that, campus, away from campus. <laughs> well, no, that, that actually does still, matter. That actually no, does matter. It's, 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 a, it's a, the guns being fired in the vicinity of people. <laughs> That's bad. Yeah, can, I can, I just, can, I jump, can I jump in here? Yeah, I got it. Mm -hmm. I think we need to. I think, I think we need to start listening to the kids, because that's that. Those are the voices I've been hearing. Those are the voices I've been trying to amplify on social media and stuff. Are the kids who are saying this is bullshit? It's ridiculous. That can't that we can't even. <laughs> the the one of the best things I saw was some teenager calling out calling out Trump on Twitter, just being just being like, we don't need your thoughts and prayers. We need action, and so this doesn't happen again. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that's all fine and dandy. There's nothing wrong with listening to to victims. Uh, um, I've been I've it, been around shootings. Okay, I've been in combat. Yeah. I, I know. I understand the stresses involved with it. I'm sorry. I'm not going to take any suggestions from some child who doesn't really understand the Constitution. So what do you, doesn't what do you understand. When I'd, I'd like to know what what um you'd suggest that could help honestly um, reduce reduce mass shootings and gun violence in America. Honestly, yeah, just exactly. Inside. Yeah, okay. In general, uh, very very quickly, I don't believe that there should be a gun free zone. I believe that places like uh like educational institutions and stuff. Uh, hear me out before everyone starts, you know, going crazy on me. If you allow you allow teachers to get a uh, level three cleat certification, that is the same certification that you see with armed security guards. It doesn't take away from their job. It's just in case of an emergency, hey, they're there, they are concealed carry, and they can actually fire back. Uh, the biggest problem that you see with mass shootings and stuff is police response times. If you have a good guy with a gun, you know, these instances... Good guys with a gun don't stop bad guys with guns. I'm sorry, that's just... Um, Wait, we don't, yeah, need, these, we don't a, need these okay, empty platitudes. Okay, we need action. Well, that is action. Yesterday. Okay, no, it, it's right now is not an action. the The whole idea of trying to take away the Constitution that the United States was built on is not an no, action. That's no, actually tyranny. No, stop, stop. It's it's not about tyranny. It's not about my own position on gun control and arms is complicated. I'm not all like let's get rid of all the guns ever and like let's not allow guns for self defense. I'm not. I'm not in that camp at all. Well, and that's fine, you know. But I'm I'm talking but, about common sense things. Some people are like, "Can oh, I respond to good guy versus bad guy with guns?" Thing, please, first before we okay. move on. Okay. Can we so, hear from? Uh, uh, is it okay if we hear from Ted as well? Because I think he's yeah, saying yeah. something. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I totally missed that. Do you want to talk, Ted? Go for it. Uh, I I just wanted to say, why could anyone justify having Firearms in school. Exactly. Yeah, I, I, I just I agree. Got... <laughs> like I, said, I was about to add on that is the whole having like a good guy does not stop a bad guy with a gun. And the example that I was going to give is Chris Kyle, the American sniper guy. Um, him and a friend were driving another friend to a driving range because he had PTSD and they wanted to try and help with PTSD. And they were both shot and killed, even though they both had guns and they were trained military men with guns. If those yeah. two guys can't stop a bad guy with guns. I mean, introducing more guns to the situation doesn't stop it. It doesn't okay. stop problem. I think I think that's part of the problem with this mass shooting anyway, a part of the gun culture. And I don't know if like adding more guns to the situation would uh this way, the gun culture problem that we have in America. That's one of the facets that I think uh we as a country just has to combat and confront and acknowledge that we have a gun culture problem. Um, just quickly before everyone yes. starts, yeah. um, just quickly, uh, seeing as we all want to uh, sort of say stuff, I think I'm going to like write down the order everyone wants to like say things in so that we're not all like cutting each other off and stuff. So yeah. 
Okay. Um, I'll jot down who wants to say. Does anyone have anything to say like right now? And I'll like. Uh, write them. Yeah. Can I say a couple things? So um, we'll go aircraft. Uh, Sparky. Then who after um, Sparky? Piper, I think, wants to say something. Piper, um, yeah, Ashley, I, to say, I think. Uh, no, I don't have anything else to say about uh, this topic. Okay, so it's just Ash, uh, Sparky, and Piper then, yeah. I will say more things. Oh, um, I, to say. Might, <laughs> I, I might have a few words, but I don't have much to say. Okay, um, so Sparky, Piper, Mike, um, and Chris, and then I'd like to say something uh, at some point as well. Um, and then we'll move on. So, Sparky, take it away. Okay, well, see, here's here's the problem that I have. I don't agree with gun-free zones because gun-free zones just make a soft target. As prior military, as a vet, who's someone who's been in combat zones, I know that areas that are declared gun-free, that are sans weapons, sans defense, they're nothing but a soft target looking to be shot at. Most of these people who do these quote-unquote mass shootings are themselves cowards. And are honestly looking to, to inflict as much damage until the police respond and eventually take them out. Yes, they may know that they, they are going to die doing the deal, but they also have that slight glimmer of hope that they're going to be able to leave prior to the time police respond. Average response time of police in the United States of America is 11 minutes. Considering that the police are a reactionary force and we do not want to change, take them beyond that, we do not want them as a preventative force, we want them to be a reactionary force, that way we, they don't infringe on the liberties of the American citizen, that you would want to take away the soft target. So what you would do is you would allow teachers to volunteer for a program for level three cleat certification where they can carry a gun and defend their students if the problem arises. Now, it's not saying, oh, more guns is the answer. No, I'm talking about proper training, maybe a little bit more money for those teachers and stuff, but also a means to defend the students. That I don't think there's anything wrong with that, and you don't have to hire more people, thus creating um, more positions for benefits that need to be filled, costing the state even more, even more money. So you just raise the raise the pay of these teachers up who volunteer for this because they're taking on an additional duty, and you know it may not solve the problem, but it would be at least a deterrent because people don't go in shooting up police stations because they know that it is it's a non-starter. They're going to end. They're going to end quick. You know, and that's not what they want. So if you make it to where there's deterrence, because that's really what guns, guns are really good at, is to be used as a tool for deterrence. If someone steps into my house, people know everywhere that I move, I have guns. And I don't get, people do not break into my house because they have seen the, those guns and that is a deterrent. I really hope I never have to use my weapon in defense of my family you know, or any other person. I've had to do it in war, and it's not a fun thing. But all at the same time, deterrence. What keeps honest people honest? Okay, think about this for a moment. You have locks on your door. That lock doesn't start, doesn't really stop a criminal. Your windows don't stop a criminal. That stops honest people. So if you really believe that taking away guns from everyone is the answer, then I have I have this challenge to you. Leave your windows open and your door open at all times, even when you leave the house. Put a little note on front stating, hey, please don't rob me. Thanks. Have a nice day and see how, how long your stuff exists or if your family is safe under those conditions. Honestly, there are some shit people in this world. Not all of them. Hashtag, there's a lot of great people in this world, but there's also a lot of shit people. And it's deterrence for the shit people is what we need. My opinion. Okay, so I believe it was Piper um, after Sparky. And if you want to say yeah. first, uh, in relation to that. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yes, oh, yeah. yes Piper, we can so, hear you. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So there are a few things that I wanted to say. Because there's kind of a lot to address in that. Um, now, I do want to say off the bat that I am not for gun control. I don't, you know, even when people, you know, pitch the idea of quote unquote common sense background checks, I have arguments against that. I don't necessarily agree with that. So I will say that, but I'm also not of the mind 
that uh, simply giving a bunch of good guys guns is going to stop the quote unquote bad guys. And that's because, you know, it's, you know, it's, that's a, you know, it's not it, like statistically that's, that doesn't work. So uh, when people have guns and something like a mass shooting happens, um, then, you know, so the, and they have the opportunity to, you know, take the person who's doing the mass shooting out. A lot of the time they don't do it because they're scared and they don't know what to do in that situation. Even if they have, uh, you know, the training or whatever, it's, uh, you know, that is a stressful situation where anybody is going to be hard pressed to step up and be the hero and take out the mass shooter. Um, now, generally, uh, the the solution of giving more people guns uh, doesn't address the issue. The issue isn't that we don't have enough guns. Uh, the United States has the most guns per capita of any country, right? It is. So we have plenty of guns, right? And the guns that we have, I would add, are not going anywhere despite whatever legislation people call for. Um, so the issue is not that we don't have enough guns in people's hands. The issue is something like uh, violence in society is directly co correlated generally with the level of social inequality, be it economic or in political power. And we are a very e unequal society in the United States. Hey, Ashley, we can we always hear, you hear the statistics can, about. Can, you know, sorry. We always hear the statistics, sorry. Always hear the no statistics about 1% of the people owning the lion's share of all wealth and so on and so forth. More than the bottom, uh, you know, more than the bottom 40% put together, you know, statistics like that. Um, and there's also the fact that uh, in political power terms, there is pretty much no equality either because uh, the uh, policies that, um, you know, I mean, so the government policy and how the government acts, um, you know, they're, they're, those, that's not, those things are not dictated by, uh, you know, the mass of people. They're dictated by specific moneyed interests that have a lot of wealth that they can throw at buying candidates and buying policy. Um, so I think that's where you have to look to address the, to actually address the mm. issue of gun violence and violence in society in general. And, you know, sorry Absolutely. if I'm being a little bit long winded, but I do want to say one thing before I stop. And um, when the issue of, um, you know, asking what the kids think, the people who are actually victims of these mass shootings. And I would include the teachers in that and the school faculty because exactly. they are also... Right? So when that was brought up, um, uh, I'm not sure, aircraft base... That was me. Oh, aircraft, aircraft Sparky. There you go. Sorry. Yes. Um, Just call me said, Sparky. It's fine. Okay, Sparky. So you said, oh, well... I'm a, you know, I'm a military veteran. I do not need to take into account the opinions of a bunch of children. Well, yes, and I'm sorry. Uh, can I can I respond well, real quick to that? Okay, I'm, um, I'm not trying to be mean. Actually, um, I didn't actually you, make my point. I'm yeah, um, we'll, we'll, like um, yeah, Mike, really. you, go, you go ahead. You go ahead, Mike. You can respond in a second, Sparky. Yeah. So, uh, anyway, the point that I was trying to make. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So the point that I just wanted to make quickly about that is I'm sorry, but those are the people who are getting, you know, shot and killed. So I think you do have to listen to the opinions of a bunch of children. I'm done now. Take it away, Mike. Hi. Um, okay. So I have a, I have a lot of uh, opinions about all this. First of all, um, the whole good man, good guy, I've already kind of said it, good, good guy with a gun, big bad guy with a gun. No, it's that, I mean, that's just a, a platitude that I, I don't see any substantial evidence for. So I think that's kind of stupid. Um, not, not, I'm sorry if I, I, I didn't mean to, I don't mean to say that about anyone, but I think that's a stupid sentiment. Um, and 
giving gums to teachers again i mean it's the good guys with gums thing i think that's, that's stupid um uh, why would you i mean you say about training and stuff but but uh, like i said before the training doesn't necessarily do that and then again you're you're introducing gums to a classroom so what happens when when a teacher accidentally stu uh, shoots a student but, you know that, i mean there's all these complications that go along with that um mike your we audio hear you, your michael Yeah, I don't know. We yeah. can't hear you. Yeah, Mike, your audio cut out for some Yeah, reason. you dropped out, buddy. Oh, no. No! Hello, hello, hello. Okay, hello. There you go. Brilliant, Mike. Hello, hello, hi, hello, hello. You're back, yep, you're back. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Keep going did, from... Did you, did you, said, you hear um, any of that, or did I just... You heard up to the point where you said um, a teacher will accidentally shoot a student, I think. Okay, uh, yeah, so t that, that thing, um, the gun-free gun zones being a target for stuff, uh, New Zealand and Australia are both gun-free, and we don't have any mass shootings. Um, and I know people say like, oh, well, they're different countries, such and such. I'm not saying, my, my opinion isn't that we should get rid of all the guns or that you should get rid of all the guns to begin with. I think that there needs to be some common sense regulations though, because currently it's just like, nope, nope, we're not gonna do anything. We're not gonna, that. we're not gonna solve any problems. We're just gonna keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. I think there needs to be some common sense regulation. Um, the whole idea that that going against the constitution is going against the, the, the God-given right of the American people, I think that's stupid as well. There are amendments in the constitution. The constitution mm -hmm. can be amended because it's been 200 years since the constitution was written. Guns have changed. The gun laws need to change. Um, and the other thing that I was going to say was um, uh, uh, guns as deterrents. Uh, again, I live in a house. We don't have any guns. Other people don't have guns. There are people in New Zealand who have guns, but there are regulations. You have to have a gun cabinet. You have to have a license. You can't have assault rifles. You just have like, uh, you know, your hunting rifle. So you can go out, go hunting. You can kill animals if that's your your thing um uh, you know but no one goes around like i can't think of a time when anyone's been shot in new zealand ever and since the 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 hardcore gun regulation was introduced in australia after the port douglas mass shooting no mass shootings zero so i mean gun control works you can introduce certain things to deter gun violence and adding more guns and adding more people with guns and things to the situation just Makes it worse. Anyway, I needed to ramble. I need to go. I'm sorry. I um, it was nice talking to you, Mr. Um, Aircraft. Um, that was all I needed to kind of say. But I've got to go and take my cat to the vet. So. No problem. Bye, <laughs> take care, <laughs> Michael. Bye, Michael. See, see you later, team. Adios. That's been you. Right, yeah, so, Mike. so after Mike, we had American anarchist. Uh, so take it away, anarchist. Yeah. I mean, I was going to bring up that um, much like Piper being, you know. Being a leftist, I'm not really in favor of, like, gun control, especially historically in America. It has really only ever targeted um, people who are more likely to be the victims of said gun violence. So, but I tend to be very skeptical of the idea that, um, you know, uh, honestly, a lot of um, what I was thinking was kind of covered by Piper, and I assumed that this would happen. Um, but, you know, I'm very skeptical of the idea that um, just introducing more guns or introducing more trained people with guns will help in the long run. And I think that there are some underlying problems not really related to the guns themselves. Like, I don't think taking away the guns is going to deal with the root problem either. I think that the root problems have to do with stuff like, um, you know, social alienation and, you know... Um, I feel that we teach a lot of people, you know, teaching people that they might be more like entitled to specific things socially. And then they come into the real world and they realize that that isn't actually the case, you know, and, um, also, like I said, social alienation, I think is really a big deal. And that's something that we definitely need to learn how to like you know we as a society need to basically I, I think that we as a society need to learn how to like treat people better um and you know um teach better um y you know yeah basically teach people some more um empathy i'm trying to think of the word for it but you know mm. um you know 
just I think that it's more of a radical uh, I think a radical change in society um you know I think this coincides with stuff like capitalism and stuff like um mm -hmm. yeah you know I I think that radical change in the system is what needs to happen and it's not even really related to the guns but more uh, um so but I think it's a mu it's much more of a social problem I think that's what's really the root of these mass shootings yeah, because, see, I'll you know, agree with no, you. Um, I will so agree with Barking. you right there. Um, you can have to say your piece in a second. Just um, it's next. It's some random geek. Uh, so it's getting for everyone. <laughs> uh, no problem. So uh, there's there's uh, one thing I haven't brought up. I don't think has been brought up. Okay, the idea, the libertarian idea of like just give give more people guns and properly train them and so like that. In a case of like a mass shooting. Okay, but the problem is that if you've got a, a bad guy with a gun starts shooting someone, and then you have a good guy with a gun start shooting at that guy, I, or other good guys thinking, I'll be the good guy, start shooting the gun. Then you got the problems like who do know where the logistical problem of who shot what at what time, where the bullets hit, and there also the potential of collateral damage of trying to be a hero with it be the good guy with the gun so i have that's why i have a problem with uh, that idea of like give more people guns or give her the gun free zone and stuff like that and i i have my complicated views on guns and in my opinion i would be great if like we can get rid of guns but i know that that's unrealistic in this country unfortunately it's the reality of the world that people have guns and people people feel entitled to have the guns and stuff like that. Okay, and definitely there's definitely arguments that for people who are marginalized do or feel more disempowered that the guns good safety for them. And yeah, I uh, uh, so. I'm not going to be advocating for giving rid of all guns, but at least like some legislation against RF-15s. Why do we need? You don't need a semi-automatic rifle to do hunting. I people can hunt. I have no problem with that. So people can have hunting rifles and stuff like that. But RF-15s, I don't see the point of that and stuff like that. So yeah, and and yeah, mental illness is not the subject either. And if people are serious about the mental illness, it should be free and available to anyone in this country and easily be accessible for anyone. So that if mental health problems is the problem i'm not saying it is if that is the problem then people can easily get mental health resources to possibly help in that regard so that's some of my things and i'll let uh, someone know, the next person go okay um so just quickly ted um wolf or ashley if you want to respond before i um say something because um you didn't say initially that you wanted to um say anything but i just oh, want to check okay. for sure um yeah, um... Oh, my bit so quick. Am I gonna get on screen? You're on screen now. Yeah. Oh, I I wasn't on my screen, but I'll just go anyway. But the more guns argument. The other trouble is the more guns there are, the more psychological pressure everyone's under. They, even the good guys, good guys in inverted commas, come, something's gonna go wrong. People are gonna make a mistake when there's that many guns involved. So I think that's another reason why the good guys should have guns argument from his flat. Yeah, I agree. No, exactly. Um, and Wolf, you were gonna say something as well? Yeah, I was, um, yeah, I agree with what Rose said. There's, there's a there's a big issue when it comes to alienation, and some people are bringing out mental illness. And it's sort of it is it is a thing that's a problem that's on Twitter when we bring it up because that's very alien to people with you know the, the regular type of diseases like you know depression, um, you know anxiety, all those type of things. Like you know that you could stretch it if it was um, something to do with 
someone with a, you know, um, there could be a particular extreme personality disorder, like um, sociopathic type pathology. I mean, maybe that's like somewhere along the lines. But it's just, um, I think we go down a rabbit hole a little bit if we go down one thing, because there's a lot of different tools. I mean, some people bring up toxic masculinity, I mean, there could be something, because that's to do with the socialization and some of the things, and that's like, that's sort of unprisoned. But then I guess we've got to look at it through multiple prisons, and the more that we have them, the more we can kind of illuminate the problem. Yeah, no, I agree, like, certainly. Um, and Ashley, did you want to say anything before I say my sort of um, response? I just wanted to say um, on the issue of uh, mental health, um, yeah, men me mental health, uh, it might, ha it may have some connection to these mass shootings, it may not, but I, d I do want to point out that I think the mental health ar argument is connected at least tangentially to talk the concept of toxic masculinity because as was part of my exchange with mr elam as, as i as i kind of explained in that exchange um part of toxic masculinity is teaching men and boys to um keep it in keep their emotions yeah. bottle their emotions and not express them freely and healthily and speaking as a person well obviously not not a man but a person who ha has depression and has suffered from um anxiety and suicidal ideation even recently i can say i can say from experience that bottling your emotions doesn't help it only makes things it only makes it worse not expressing it makes it worse and st statistically i found that men are less likely to seek therapy and counseling if they need it or like medication or even diagnosis um, so that's definitely worth discussing. And, um, again, I'm not for gun control and I, and I do, see, and I, I, I do see the, the things that, um, American Anarchist was talking about, about how guns, how gun control has mostly been used to keep, to keep guns out of the hands of people in marginalized groups who are more likely to be victims of violent crime. In fact, I've, I've, on my public Facebook page, I've shared, um, stories of LGBTQ plus uh, gun rights groups. So, like, I'm not anti-gun totally, but I, I do think these are. I, I and I and like, I believe Lonely Wolf said this. I I, I agree that we should be listening to. I I, I I I'm gonna reiterate. We should be listening to the kids because they are the victims. They were there. They saw friends of theirs and teachers of theirs die. So yes, you don't just say you're a kid. Who cares what you think? It's like because they matter. Agreed. Okay. Um, thank you, Ashley. And now, I get to say my bit after all of you have gone. Um, right, so fundamentally, I think that um, with the ideas about guns, we need to be addressing more than just the guns themselves, but the culture that they exist in. So like um, Anarchist and Piper said, um, and Ashley and Wolf touched on, you need to be looking at the fact that we live Just going to say, Owen, you can call me Rose. Oh, in fact, okay. Troy has already has. <laughs> okay, then. Uh, yeah, well, like, 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 sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so like Rose and Piper were saying, um, we live in a society, or in America, they have a society that has deep systemic problems. So, like they said, if you just put a gun control law in, like that's not going to address um, the people who are largely doing these shootings, but rather be an excuse for the police to go into. Um, predominantly black society, um, communities and really ramp up the oppression on them. It's going to be an excuse for um, the police to crack down on targeted individuals to, you know, continue the systemic oppression of the state onto the people um, in the name of capitalism and stuff. Um, so, you know, you need to be observing the societal factors that contribute to the problems, uh, like toxic masculinity, as Ash you mentioned, Ashley, and, um, li and like the um, problems with regulation that we're seeing, where it's, you know, it's not really doing a very good job of um, making things better. Um, but with that, you obviously got to analyse that um, guns themselves, just adding more of them, isn't really a very good idea, because like Ted was saying, the um, idea that you can just throw in, you know, all this training and um, all these extra guns and firearms into places isn't going to help anything. What if someone um, makes a mistake due to the added pressure of there being guns everywhere? 
what if something goes wrong and you know that goes on wrong all the time i'm sure we've all seen videos of accidental like shootings and stuff like i remember a pretty horrific one of like a young girl um fully like firing a automated weapon into their gun instructor like if that happened in a controlled environments like a gun range I mean, what do you think is going to happen in an environment with loads of children who many of whom like you know they're wild like crazy things like young kids <laughs> it takes a lot of you lots of people don't understand how much effort goes into teaching a class for the children like it's hard enough getting them to sit down and concentrate imagine having like a gun some kids they'll you know um be throwing pens around and like being a nuisance with anything they can get their hands on imagine if um if like one busy morning a gun's just left out or it's left in a place that um can be accessed by the kids and you know that's going to happen at some point because teachers like they're not always going to be 100 percent on the ball um so to take isolated incidents and say yeah we need to do xyz without thinking about the wider size of context is futile in my opinion um because we need to really understand that in our capitalist society, there's more problems than just um, one select field. And we can't understand the problems with gun culture in America without understanding the problems of capitalism on top of that and with masculinity on top of that. Um, so, yeah, to conclude, I think Piper and um, Rose had it right uh, by saying that we need to, rather than saying, yeah, we need gun control, we need to be saying, we need to address the core problems with American society and with society at large, which is, um, in my and many others' op opinions, capitalism. <laughs> and the way um, we sort of engage ourselves within this system um, and how it manifests in atrocities like uh, mass shootings. Um, and I will let Sparky finally get to reply to the like eight or so people who've said stuff to him now. Okay. Um... And sorry if I accidentally broke into anyone. Um, first of all, um, American Anarchist Rose um, touched on something that actually is, is one of my big talking points. Um, it's cultural. It is more of a cultural issue than it is truly a gun issue. Uh, what was acceptable? To, what is acceptable today versus what was acceptable 20, 30 years ago have completely changed. I remember when I was going to school. We had a couple drive-bys, and you know, after a while, people actually thought that it was okay. It was actually glorified by the media and such. So we're we're really looking at the the breakdown of of the Western culture, as I see it. Um, you see people glorifying these acts of violence when it doesn't really need to be. Um, the mental health issue is actually something I am concerned with because mental health is on uh, the decline of mental health is on the rise in the Western world. I don't know if I could blame capitalism. I don't really understand the the tie between capitalism and mental health and all this other stuff. But hey, I, I'm sure I'll get the I'll get to hear more of that down the road. Um, here is a hard fact: um, 11.6 people per 100,000 are killed in America by cars and auto accidents. Where only 4.8 per 100,000 people are killed by guns. It is amazing that if a suicide bomber blows blows himself up in a crowded field, we blame the bomber and not the bomb. If a drunk driver plows through people, we blame the driver and not the car. Yet if someone pulls a trigger on a gun, for some reason people want to blame an inanimate object. It makes no sense. Um, one of the um, Ted, you are agree. I do agree with you, my man. Um, the problem with more guns is that there is a chance for more confusion. Um, addressing the deal about training. When it comes to training, how do you think the military actually does all their maneuvers? They train until it becomes second nature. Um, people who are in armed professions, that's what they thats what they do in their free time just for fun because they don't want to make those mistakes. So, I mean, it would take an actual um, effort by the teachers if they were, you know, to become concealed carry, class three, cleat certificate certified which uh, class three certification means that they would be able to conceal carry as well as carry non-lethal weapons such as tasers and stuff not everything has to be responded to with a bullet and the reason why i say that i don't want to allow children to set policy okay i have no problem listening to them and their concerns but however children don't understand enough about the law to really enact policy decisions it's nothing against their experiences, but if they don't even have the basic knowledge to comprehend why some of these ideas won't work, 
really you can't take their ideas that seriously. It, it's just a, it's a basic knowledge. It's a knowledge gap is really all it is. It's nothing against them. It's just they don't have the life experiences. I have been in combat. Um, I've seen the chaos of war. And it is scary. But with proper training, you can get through it. Um, it is not just guns that mass killings happen with. Um, Saturday in China, 33 was killed by a knife man. One guy, one knife, lots dead. So really, with proper training, almost anything can be extremely de deadly to many people at the same time. I'm not sitting there going, oh, well, they're the same, because they're not. Let's be honest. This kid, this kid was trained on how to use how to use the weapon. I have no problem with that. I believe that children should be taught on proper, safe use of firearms. But this person took that knowledge and bastardized it by pulling the fire the fire alarm inside of a school, forcing people to leave his school, leave a school, which gave him a nice kill window, and he shot people. This person, I believe, does have some mental deficiencies, although. There, there's really no record that has been 100% proven still waiting on the police the police records. Yes, there is a problem in America. I believe it's mostly cultural. I, I believe that many people here will agree that there is a cultural problem in America. I would, act, I would actually say that it's kind of an umbrella thing going on in the West. Is it capitalism? Ah, I'll argue no, but I think it's more of a lack of standards on the populace itself. Thank okay. you. Um, no problem, uh, Sparky. So um, we come to that time again when we need to decide an order uh, for who's going to go when. Um, so I suggest we go in reverse order this time um, so that uh, maybe Ashley, Wolf or Ted uh, wants to go first and then we work our way down in order there. So who would like to go first out of you three, if anyone? Well, if no one's picking it up, uh, I'd like to say something. Okay, uh, so firstly, um, you, Geek, and then after Geek, who would like to go? I'll go say. All I'm going to say is that I've Brilliant. said my piece on this issue, so... Okay. Um, we'll Until come we change issue, yeah. I'm... Yeah. Brilliant, Rose. Um, all right, so that leaves Wolf, Ashley, Piper, and... I'll, I'll go last again, because I feel as though... As the uh, sort of host, I shouldn't really like be talking over everyone else. Um, I really don't have. Actually, I really don't have anything else to say on this issue. I said okay. what I needed to. Brilliant. Okay. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, so now it's just Wolf and Piper. You two, um, the same as. Yep. Um, I'll be, I'll be the short <laughs> Sorry, Wolf. I guess I have um, something short, but I guess specific to say. So. Okay. Um, so you can go after Ted Piper, and then Wolf, you want to go yeah. for? Or... Brilliant. All right, and then I'll go after Wolf. Take it away, Geek. Okay, so the... Yes, it's true that a lot of people do uh, die and get injured by cars, but we can... that's kind of a necessity. We use that more than just, like, harming people. So that's one point to that. And while guns, I... You can use it for protection, so but I don't know. It's just like I feel like the use of the gun is compared to the use of the car is just not equivalent. So I don't think we can compare it to stats of like the harm that's done by cars to harm that's done by guns. Uh, let's see. Uh, it, now it is, I do kind of agree there's a cultural problem, but it's multifaceted, and I think capitalism is part of that because with capitalism, it becomes we are living in a dog eat dog world. And we live in that dark, eat dark world because of capitalism. We have to like look out for just ourselves and not look out for others. And that's and that's a broad point, but I think that's part of the, uh, the whole uh, debate and stuff like that. So uh, I'll leave it off of there and let let Ted go next. But I can't see analogy that exactly the same. Being in the war, sold, sold you in the war. They're there for combat. That is the one purpose where someone in the classroom 
They're not meant to kill bodies. They should only be an extraordinary awful scenario. And they can never be trained for that in the same way a soldier can, if that makes sense. It does, actually. It does make a lot of sense. Good point, Ted. Brilliant, yeah. Um, Piper, uh, you said you had a succinct, succinct yeah. point. Yeah. Um, this has to do with the listening to children thing. Um, I don't know necessarily what you mean by children setting policy. Um, I do think that children, since they, you know, uh, do not have the rounded experience that adults have. I mean, Leo, obviously everyone thinks that there are things that children should not be allowed to do that adults can do because they are more experienced. They have, uh, their brains are developed fuller, etc. Right. So I, I get that point, but I don't, uh, I don't, I, so, but I will say that, um, that it's not that this, that doesn't mean that, uh, children, uh, when you're setting policies that are that specifically affect them, that they should just be, uh, I guess, uh, they should just passively adhere to those policies, right? I think that's totally wrong. Um, I think as human beings, they have the basic right to have some input into the policies that affect them. And if people want to object with the idea that children are too stupid to have any input, well, I would say that that's not true. Uh, that's because, uh, and I would say that that's because there are different models of schooling that, uh, you know, different models of schooling that we don't use in general in, uh, you know, the West or really anywhere else um, that are actually based on uh, the input of the children that go to the school and um, and, you know, where they make a lion's share of the decisions, even about, let's say, discipline. Uh, that model is called uh, free schooling um, or, you know, democratic schooling. And that does exist. There's uh, a democratic school in Britain. Uh, I don't remember the name of it. But uh, so th that model uh, actually gives these children a say in the policies of the school and it runs, you know, just, you know, it runs just as smoothly as anything else. Um, so I think the idea that, you know, children are, you know, not saying anyone necessarily said this, but children are stupid therefore. So, you know, therefore they should have no input. I think that's wrong. I think they actually can and should have a great deal of input. Brilliant. Um, so I believe it was Wolf next. Yep. Yeah, so um, the, I guess the topic that comes up sometimes we hear these, a lot of terminology comes up on Twitter when we say the word toxic masculinity. And I think it's just, it's one of those unfortunate side effects of when, you know, there's a certain term that might circulate in academia to describe something that's, you know, because we can describe it in everyday language, but unfortunately, you know, some things do filter down through the academic and lens to the lap of the general consciousness. and. And yeah, that's when you look at the actual term itself, it explains some of the sociological aspects of, you know, certain um, ways in which, you know, men can suffer. And and I can say that, I mean, I don't, because I don't necessarily identify as a, as a feminist or an MRA, um, like I probably fit more in the lines of men's liberation rather than MRA, because I'm sort of a person that Paul Elam wing of that. So it's, it's an issue that I've probably talked about anyway without even realizing that I was using that word anyway. So it's not really, it's not a scary term for those people who are um, like the non-feminists or whatever. It's, it's, it's sort of not too bad. I mean, some people can weaponize the word and use it in the wrong context or something like that. And yeah, that's, that's sort of where I'm coming from because I sort of, I still talk a lot to men's issues. That's what I do on my channel a lot of the time and to sort of include, I guess, trans men issues as well. So that's the, advantage in the men's movement there's more like men's liberation is starting to gain more momentum um so like what i've been trying to do with my channel it's it's kind of a positive thing we're seeing that a lot of other men's groups are coming up on twitter and 
yeah, it's, it's a better, it's sort of a much better model of sort of looking at particular um, men's issues rather than that Elan wing, because there's a lot of ways that he's screwed over men as well as women. Mm. Yeah. Um, just a heads up, um, Wolf, uh, your um, audio in that um, last segment there was a little bit um, tinny or something. I'm not oh, sure what yeah. Yeah, I was all over the place then when I tried to make the point. <laughs> oh, no, no, the point was fine. It was more the um, audio. Yeah. Um, I don't know what it was, but... Yeah, so if you see, because I know that MRA, like that usually leaves a sour taste, but if you see the, um, usually the word men's liberation or masculinism, those are the two words that it's more, it's more along the lines of what I um, advocate for. So it's a bit more healthier. So it's an alternative to MRA that doesn't necessarily have that kind of grievance Mm. That kind of bitterness that comes with the mainstream MRA that kind of it's unpalatable to me that that Elan stuff. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, oh, sorry, okay. um so oh, sorry, Ashley, so sorry about that. Um so I think you mentioned something about toxic masculinity. So I think I read somewhere that it's it's not just men who can suffer that because I know it kind of makes sense that women could suffer the same thing as well because it's when we mix around their gender roles, et cetera, like theoretically it could affect both men and women, like the, the same kind of, um, the same kind of things that men may suffer and will happen to women as well. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Like issues do affect everyone rather than just an individual mm-hmm. group. Mm-hmm. Um, so I believe um, I come next. Uh, <laughs> I'll try and be quick because I think we should um, probably start to move forward from the um, gun issue because uh, I get the impression um, we'll be here all night if we just uh, continue on this topic. We should probably save it for more focused um, discussions on it and stuff. And certainly um, if we want to continue at an- another point, then we can do that. Um, but anyway, yeah, I'll just try and uh, wrap up. Um, once again, um, some pretty good points were made. Uh, Ted, you mentioned um, that you know, the um, teachers and soldiers have different roles in society, and that's pretty, you know, um, a good place to start. Like, the idea of just having people just suddenly take on entire new training courses away from their um, specialised field to spend time learning how to fire a gun for this potential threat is not only really harmful to both uh, to their profession, like, you know, they're directly come away from doing what they should be doing for help their job, um, do your time a, a subject they shouldn't really have to do in the first place um we want to be in a position where we're saying why how can we stop the problem rather than saying how are we going to place a plaster over the problem like we don't want to be sort of addressing the um ways we can make teachers stop the attack from being as deadly we want to be saying no we want the attacks to stop so let's think about how we're going to do that so it's more you know pre- um prevention is better than cure um, then you said Piper with um about kids and stuff, and I, I think that it's silly to um you know t- um <laughs> interpret this as oh yeah um we want kids to literally be making our decisions for the country and stuff. The point that you are making and which I agree with is that you know, you, they have a human they've got to be considered in the um decisions of the nation because you know they have autonomy as people they're human beings. So the fact that people are going into schools and like shooting up the entire place and killing people who are just starting life is abhorrent and you know shows fundamental problems with society especially as it's been going on for decades now you know because there are people who um were survived columbine and now instead of seeing real change in society they're instead seeing another generation go through the same stuff and lose people who could have like lived amazing lives and lost their right to life because of someone with a gun um and really i think that um as i was saying earlier um guns themselves um they do have a role in um society they can have a role but you know the fact that there's so many of them in areas where they shouldn't be and in scenarios where they're being used to inflict harm onto people is part of a wider problem and to come back to what you were saying sparker i believe there is a problem in the west and the world as a whole and i think again it is you know, capitalism at um, core, um, because, I mean, it's easy to sort of figure it out, oh, you know, the lefty is just going against it, but we've got to really think about why there are these problems in society. You mentioned mental health, and 
you look at the way society is where you know workers are forced into selling their labor or they you know have no access to the elements of life they need to survive and then promptly starve that's going to make people unhappy um we look at the way um with you know it's a toxic masculinity we're taught about um men and women the way so society conditions us to view the world the air of entitlement some men have and you look at someone like um the shooter and um that is resembled in that and the fact that he gets that impression of society and he feels that he needs to act in that way is born of a certain social conditioning um there's always more to every element in society than um meet, initially meets the eye and to you know suggest that um you can just compare one stat to another so for you mentioned deaths per car um and deaths per guns per 100,000 people i find that to be a little bit um almost naive really because um like geek said you know cars are used more frequently um and again even that you can apply to capitalist um Chris's critique because you know you could say that oh well if there weren't um if society was run by everyone you could have a transport system that benefits everyone rather than just everyone having their own car and doing what they want with it and thus mm -hmm. being forced to sort of go from place like you look at um the work system where you know you have to sell your labor hours but you're gonna have to drive to work so you might be in a rush because you don't want to be late and promptly you're going to take risks which leads to deaths you look at the number of people who get sidetracked in their car on the, either on the phone or by smoking or by doing anything really um and causing crashes that way you look at the way cars are built where lots of developers and producers they want to build cars as cheaply as possible to maximize profits so suddenly their cars aren't as safe and are more likely to break down or crash or be unsafe on the road and thus cause more accidents there's always more to every single facet of society that we can attribute to the conditions placed upon it um so to draw us back to guns um whilst yeah the gun rate um the gun deaths per uh, hundred thousand people may be lower than other things um the fact that you know stuff as horrific as you know a load of kids being shot up in a school is happening so frequently in america is something that needs to be discussed and it's a part of a wider issue with um culture in america and under capitalism um and i want to sort of move on from this sort of point um but i feel as though we all have um more to say i don't know if you wanted to say anything briefly sparky but um if you could try and um keep it relatively uh concise i suppose before we end the point i just want to say one thing i swear officer i was not smoking any weed <laughs> <laughs> you said smoking in the car so that just immediately came to my head uh honestly the only thing that the only thing that I want to touch on is Geek mentioned um, how I talked about cars and how cars and cars and guns are basically two different things, um, not not really anything all that comparable. And I, I I counter with this. The only reason why I brought it up is because it's an it's an inanimate object. Okay, there's actually more guns in America than there are vehicles, um, and yet vehicles attribute to way more deaths per hundred thousand. And I'm just looking at statistics, you know. Uh, and I know that they're not used to kill, but the only reason why I brought up cars was because of they're just a tool. That's all they are. Uh, a gun is a piece of machinery. The gun itself has not really evolved much since, honestly, 19, 1950s, 1960s. The only thing that's really uh, upgraded in guns uh, recently has been ammunition. There are some things called smart ammunitions. But, um, yeah, that's way too deep to get into. But, man, great talk. Thank you for at least giving me the opportunity, you know, not completely calling me an idiot out on this. Um, I, I seem – this seems to be an actually decent conversation. I appreciate that. Excellent. Um, you sound like you're about to go, uh, Sparky. Is Oh, no, no, no. Just oh, um, okay, uh, honestly, the civility of this, of, of this honestly kind of surprised me. <laughs> um, okay. you know, and I'm, I'm just being honest. I'm not, you know, I'm not putting any, uh, I've done streams with, um, with lonely wolf. Um, I know that I've seen streams between lonely wolf and random geek. Um, oh, and I've, I've, me and you, we've gone back and forth here and there on Twitter, but we really have never talked to each other. Um, I haven't had the, the pleasure of being in a, in a room with Ted 
or American Anarchist, and I'm sorry. Um, I know I'm leaving so uh, Piper, and I'm leaving someone else out. Ted Ashley. Uh, Ashley, yes, Ashley. I, I haven't been in a room. With, I haven't been in a, a discussion with y'all, and I, I really appreciate how we've been civil. Yeah, I've enjoyed as it. I, as I said before, you've you've let yourself down because you haven't ironed your sheets in the background. But when I throw up the green screen stuff, it looks amazing. So it's non sequitur, bro. <laughs> uh, well, indeed, civility and uh, pleasantness is what I intend, hopefully, on these streams. Um, did anyone else want to uh, kickstart uh, the new topic or the new area of discussion? I'm not sure how much of a topic could be made out of this, but um, you know, I discovered something today. Or I discovered that it was a big thing today. Um, I did find a few examples of it um, a couple days before, but Google Nestor Machno is a thing, and I think that's um, pretty interesting. Oh, Google what? You know, the, the, the Nestor Machno, um, Ukraine 1918, I think. Yeah, you know, okay. free territory of Ukraine. Let me explain. Let me explain. Piper this knows much more this, about it than I do, but this is this is. This is my, uh, this is the topic that I'm obsessed with. So, uh, Nestor Bakhno was a Ukrainian anarchist. He, uh, was born in a village called Halepoli. And <clears throat> he, um, he was born into a peasant background. He worked on the land of... Uh, big landlords in Ukraine. This was before the Russian Revolution, so there was still a lot of um, kind of peasantry in the con you know in the country, and big landlords who exploited that pe peasantry. Um, so he worked on the uh, you know land of those landlords, and he also worked. Uh, as an industrial worker for a period of time in a factory in Ukraine. Um, and he was, he got involved with um, anarchism as a political movement. The, his first involvement with anarchism as a political movement was with a group of anarchists who would um, steal things from uh, wealthy individuals and give them away to poor individuals. And for this activity, he was thrown in jail and he lived a pretty bitter existence in jail. Um, you know, he was, uh, you know, left in solitary and freezing temperatures. He had to eat rodents to survive. Um and while in jail, he met someone who actually, you know, wrote a very long uh, book about Nestor Machno and the things that he did in Ukraine called Peter Arshinov. And Peter Arshinov was much better kind of intellectually trained in anarchism. He knew the theorists of anarchism better and the theory of it better and he kind of was Machno's uh mentor in kind of anarchist thought um and he taught you know Machno you know the anarchist theory that he knew um so you know and then once the Re Russian Revolution happens you know a bunch of you know it spreads to Ukraine the jails are destroyed uh, and the prisoners are set free. And then, you know, as such, Makhno, you know, escapes. Makhno and Peter Arshinov escape. Makhno goes back to his hometown of Halipol. And then within the Russian Revolution that had reached to Ukraine, he starts to organize, um, you know, an army of uh, peasants. Um, and this army of peasants would go on to expropriate the large landlord landlords take their land and you know make it commonly owned by all peasants um and he created and you know this peasant army which was known as the Maknovishchina, uh was you know it, it created 
in Ukraine, a fairly large, uh, you know, uh, society of communes where, um, you know, basically the society was organized collectively in a kind of non oppressive, non exploitative manner. Uh, people generally had equal power. Uh, this may be my idea, you know, this may sound ideological as an explanation, but, you know, it's my reading of it. So, um, you know, and as such, he kind of created one, you know, one of, he, he, he and his movement created an instance where, you know, oppressed people kind of took power and organized things for themselves and started to demolish their oppression and exploitation uh, and create a better society. Um, there's, you know, and militarily, the last thing I'll say about it is that militarily, his peasant army, the Maknovishchina, was also very, uh, you know, it wasn't militarily inept. Um, you know, they cultivated a guerrilla kind of military style, which was prefigurative of other kind of successful military, uh, you know, guerrilla military, uh, you know, uh, forces such as those of Mao Zedong. Um, you know, so, and he, you know, this success, you know, this, uh, kind of effective military force was able to, uh, fight off, um, you know, the combined forces of the, uh, Ukrainian national nationalists or the petrolorists and the white army, which was the reaction to the Russian revolution, which was trying to reinstate, uh, you know, the czarist, uh, regime and also, you know, and the Bolsheviks who are now in power after the Russian revolution and, um, and the, uh, colonial kind of occupation forces of, um, Austria and Germany that were invading Ukraine at the time. Uh, and I could, I could go on about this and nerd out about it for like fucking two days. I'm not going to do that though. Cause I don't want to bore people any further, but yeah, that's basically what that is. If you don't know what that is. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> that sounds cool. I, 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 this is the first time I'm learning about all of this, but that sounds really cool. So thank you for sharing that. I mean, it's even if like you're cool. not some, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, even if you're not that, someone, sorry, I know. <laughs> even if you're not like someone who really would, even if you're not someone who would like agree with the guy politically, I think that there's that he's just a pretty historically important figure. Like, it's a very interesting part of history that I don't think we're really taught in schools that I wish we were taught more about. It's the sort of thing I think should be uh, a link in the... Uh, after this Hangout is uh, finished, I'll put a link to it in the um, description. Because it sounds like the sort of thing that would be quite interesting to read about, uh, definitely. Um, yeah, I, yeah I, think I, that, I could um, recommend... I could recommend, I could recommend like, tomes of literature on it, so... Excellent. Yeah. Um, but no, I think it's um, important to uh, look back at the past and look at where um, our ideas can stem from sometimes and how uh, elements of them can go well and elements of them um, can sadly not uh, succeed as well. So, for instance, with that, um, I think it's important to look at the key ideals that were initially sort of thought about, you know, um, land being collectively owned, um, the abolition of class and the sort of freedom of the uh, working class um, from the ruling class. However, we need to also learn that um, to try and implement this in a confined space and not globally is um, probably not going to work because, you know, you're not going to see um, the ruling classes of other nations say, oh, well, you know, let's just let this um, classless society exist. They're going to think, oh, well, you know, if this society exists and is working all right, then what's the potential future for us? What if people here in um, our nation say, well, actually, no, there's no reason we should be subject to this class system. There's no reason we should continually sell our labor to um, allow you to live a life of luxury. Um, and, you know, it's in their best interest to then quash um, the potential um, society in Ukraine. And um, as we've seen over time um, in Catalonia, for instance, it's always been the case where... Um, these societies don't last particularly long. Or the Paris communes, for instance, um, where imperialist forces have gone in and like stomped out the uh, dissenting anarchists and dissenting 
communists and stuff. So you know, we need to um, have a global um, revolution, really, of the system because um, we can't coexist with a system that actively needs a um, you know class system, actively needs exploitation to thrive. Um, and I think subsequently, that's why um, a lot of ideas um, surrounding and a lot of critiques of um, like communism and stuff and of um, far left ideas are so poor because a lot of them, you know, you hear people say, oh, well, you know, if you don't like capitalism, just move to your own country or start your own land. And it's like, well, you're sort of missing the point, really, because you're ignoring the ideas that we have about class and about um capital and about the um, inherent structuring uh, and stru faults of capitalism um, <coughs> in order to you know make your pretty baseless um, statement about it like oh yeah just um, go and start your own society like what do you think is going to happen when people find a plot of land and say right we want um, communally owned like stuff here like firstly you got to find land but and like secondly how are you going to like trade and stuff if all the um, modes of like production if all the resources in society are owned by capitalists how are you not going to you know be involved in capitalism how are you going to get your um resources and technology if you're not getting it from previous like capitalist owned goods and stuff so obviously that society isn't able to um come to fruition whilst capitalism is is, is existing like we've got to realize that it's like with a um imagine like your house was infested with ants if you spray one room you're not gonna like yeah fine you've made that room better but the ants are gonna come back if you don't deal with all of them like it's the same thing capitalism is a um infection really, to um well not wanting to sound too um fanatical or anything but it is it's a um problem that has to be completely eradicated um if you're going to fix the problem because you can't you know have it um in parts sorry to ramble on there uh anyone else would like to yeah I, yeah i mean i i agree with you the thing about that in conjunction with the paris commune or spain in 1936 is that there was oh excuse me i burped a little bit when i said that uh <laughs> that was graceful um anyway so uh the thing with that is that um when you look at so what you're looking at when you study those you know kind of examples is you're looking at situations in which as i kind of said before oppressed people people who are exploited by the existing system and the people that benefit benefit from it you know you see those you're seeing those people uh take control of society uh for you know the first times in history and starting to change society in such a way that they are no longer oppressed and exploited. And, you know, the people that benefit from the existing system obviously don't want that to happen. They want the existing system to stay in place. They want to keep exploiting those people, you know, for their own benefit because, you know, they exist at the top of the system. And so they have no interest in seeing it, you know, leave, uh, you know, you know, become you know, be relegated to history. Um, so, you know, they fight back against that revolutionary change. In the case of Machno, um, the, he was eventually put, you know, his uh, peasant army was eventually put down by the Bolsheviks. Um, this, is, this started with the fact that Machno did not want to be subjugated to the Bolsheviks geopolitically. Uh, the Bolsheviks wanted Machno to be under the command of the Red Army in the fight against the Whites, and he, you know, would not capitulate to that. Um, but, you know, over time, it became, you know, a little bit more than that in the sense that uh, the Bolsheviks, after the Russian Revolution, had set up more or less the same, um, you know, capitalist society. They had set up a society where there was a class which owned you know, the, uh, the tools that are used to produce things. And as such, the vast majority of people did not own any of those things and were divested of, you know, the uh, power to, you know, produce, you know, to utilize those tools to produce what they need to survive. 
and as such, to do so, they had to, uh, you know, work under the people who owned those tools and get, you know, in exchange for that an income, and then what they produced with those tools would go to that class of people. Um, and in the case of Russia, after the Russian Revolution, that class of people was no longer individual kind of capitalists that are own individual enterprises like it is in the United States today. But it was, you know, the state and party bureaucracy of the Bolshevik Party, which controlled the state, which had nationalized all production and land. Um, so, and, you know, Makhno created... Uh, more or less the opposite of that, where there is actual real, you know, there was a real change in society, the social relations of society, and there was no longer, you know, a ruling class which exploited the vast majority of people, at least, you know, where uh, Machno's forces controlled territory and were reshaping things. Uh, and so they presented a model that was, in that sense, much more attractive and much more revolutionary than anything the Bolsheviks had created. And so, you know, the Bolsheviks couldn't let that stand. Yeah, no, exactly. Like, the um, idea that, um, I think, actually, you touched on a really um, important issue, which is that um, when you've got a power system, it's in the best interest of those who have power to maintain their power. Hence, the Bolsheviks, as the ruling party and thus, you know, technically the political ruling class, did not want a um, anarchist society, um, a system where class has been completely abolished, to come to fruition. Um, I think it's important, really, when um, you, a lot of people say, "Oh, you know, communism doesn't work because of the, you know, let's just look at Soviet Russia," um, and to say that is to ignore the actual scenario in socialist in um, Russia where you know you had a clear class system clearly not worker ownership of the means of production um clearly not basic tenants of the system described being met um and you know it's really dishonest of people to continually say when um you know people say oh we want worker ownership of society to say oh well you know it doesn't work to look at countries xyz when you know these countries are clear examples of the kind of society we want to move on from the idea that we need a class tiered system to survive, the idea that people aren't capable of thinking for themselves and need to be managed by the state. We want to move on from this, but because of the way um, capitalists have, um, or, well, not capitalists, but um, ruling class, I suppose, have built the uh, system, certainly in America, um, we're sort of, you know, sort of, you're sort of educated to think against that to say oh you know the, the bad russians um, they controlled everyone and no one had any freedom but no, here in america you're free and you know, under capitalism you've got freedom to do anything you like um and people buy into that narrative despite how clearly like false it is like oh yeah you're free but you know you've got nothing you've got no house no food and oh look a few people um these corporations these rich people they own all this they own all the land and they own all the food and if you want some you're gonna have to buy some and oh look you've got nothing to um trade you've got no money um oh but luck of you the capitalist is going to offer you some money if you sell your labor to them and they can profit off you and make billions and don't worry you've got just enough to um have some food and maybe pay your rent to a landlord because you know you're not going to buy any land because that's all owned as well um and um, luckily, uh, you know, that makes the capitalist billions whilst the workers are going to be you know, barely getting by because um, plenty of states in America don't even have a minimum wage, let alone a livable minimum wage. So your boss can pay you as little as they want. Um, and that's essentially um, the reality of capitalism where, you know, um, you've not got um, the freedom you're supposedly set out to because of the conditions that it crafts. Because capitalism is essentially the system that allows the ruling class to maintain their control. Like you look at the in, you look at um, you know the various industries in America, like television. It's controlled by five companies, which is now four because Disney bought Fox. So it's like if you want to um, enjoy television, you're making a choice between four companies. Like that's rubbish. Um, cars. Like if you've got to subscribe to a certain model. Like if you want a car, it's gonna be from. Um, like one of a few things like if you want food you can't choose um an ethical um food company because chances are 
all the food you're going to be buying is from a company that has really bad environmental practices or mistreats uh, their workers or pollutes the environment and stuff. Like it's atrocious to expect um, any sort of real freedom under capitalism because you ignore the conditions that it naturally um, like sets. Uh, so to draw these uh, sort of ramble to a um, close and to sort of link us back to what Piper was saying, um, I think you're absolutely right in that um, the Bolsheviks certainly felt threatened by the idea of a society uh, without class existing and sort of uh, serving as a um, symbol of what could be achieved beyond what the Bolsheviks had um, set out for in the USSR. Um, but also, um, once again, the, um, capitalism is the overarching problem with society. And whilst it exists, it's going to threaten any sort of talks of uh, progress because it's in, against its nature to allow real freedom for every single autonomous human being. Looks like Ashley wants to say something. Yeah, I, I, uh, I just wanted to say kind of tangentially related to that, um, to um, how capitalism, yeah, and capitalism kind of exacerbates. We were kind of having a talk in our own little chat about veganism, started by me, of course, um, and I was actually starting to think about like how much veganism is impacted by how much um, veganism and a lot of even a lot of vegans don't think of veganism as being like an anti-capitalist movement I oh my god I saw this page the libertarian vegan of course they meant they were a libertarian um, capitalist um, I'm a libertarian socialist but um anyway uh, they, they were just they were kind of going on about how like the free market gave us all these really good vegan products and that's why it's good and blah 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 it's like it's such a reductionist worldview because like capitalism is what drives like um animals to be killed at the rate they are and then the numbers they are like so quickly and like with so much worker exploitation and animals to, like be bred to be deformed um um my friend marine a privileged vegan actually has, has a video about um ableism and animal rights that kind of talks about how animals are basically bred to be disabled. I encourage you guys to check out her channel. She's awesome. Um, and yeah, like even, but even like our consumer habits as vegans are like kind of impacted by that because like there are a lot of vegans who want to boycott all these companies after they get bought by like companies that also, um, are, that are, mainly producers of meat and dairy, like what Field Roast got purchased by Tyson. And uh, way before that, Silk was purchased by um, White, White Wave, which is like a dairy producer. And like, there's an argument like a lot of libertarian vegans will make like, well, it's the free market, use your dollar. But it's like, that's, that's there's a bigger issue here. Like, and, and even like when you think about something like, Something like, a uh, food, food Empowerment Project talks about this a lot, like, uh, even, like, vegan, vegan chocolate or vegan, or just already vegan things like coffee and, like, produce, they can, they can, their market is cruelty-free, but they're, they often are involved slave labor and stuff like that, so, like, that, that's just another thing, and another way to, like, hide the unethical practices of these companies. Basically, like, no matter they, where they, you they, go, you're finding fucked up shit. Is yeah, yeah. Basically, basically. You know, yeah. Like with coffee, there's like literal slave labor. Um, you know, with human. So, yeah, I mean, with guacamole, for example, um, the Mexican drug cartels are actually very. Um, so, like, if you get avocados that are from Mexico, the um, drug cartels, the um, that are in Mexico, which, um, you know, they have a great deal of, um, political clout, um, you know, even though they're not technically legally, um, you know, 
it, it's a pretty fucked up situation there. But, um, you know, a lot of the times they're basically extorting, like, a lot of the farmers of guacamole. So, like, or not guacamole, of avocados. Um, avocados, yeah. So like, if you, so, like, if you're buying guacamole or you're buying avocados that are from Mexico, chances are some of that money is going to the drug cartels, you know. They're yeah. making... It, you know, they're making money, you know. Um, somebody fucked up somewhere is making money no matter what you buy. Yeah. And it's like, no, like, eth- like, no ethical consumption under capitalism. Exactly. Can I, um, can I interject here? Yeah, yeah, sure. Sure. Um, one of the one of the things people tend to overlook is the fact that if you if you really want to get into the ethical treatment of animals or ethical farming and stuff like that if you really want to ensure that buy your own land and do it yourself it's not that hard a lot of people have gotten away from doing things like vegetable gardening and stuff in their own yard it is possible to do it takes a little bit of work sure it takes a little bit of time out of your day you know instead of playing minecraft or whatever it is you do you know where you're sitting dead on your butt you could be out there you know fertilizing or whatever Um, feeding your own chickens, taking care of that stuff. I I see nothing wrong with that. Honestly, I think uh, more people need to learn a little bit of self-reliance. Depending on the grocery store for everything and such is is really a problem. Um, That is why you have these mega corporations that that come up. Um, One thing that capitalism does that is vastly superior over communism is the fact that you can own your own land. in communism, everything is owned by the community, the state. Um, and that leads to a lot of corruption. Uh, people are corrupt. It's going to happen. So anytime that you allow for any society to to control every aspect of your life, there's going to be corruption that's going to come with it. Even in an anarchist society, eventually some group is going to get strong enough to take over and strong arm other people. So... Capitalism isn't perfect by any means, but I think as far as what exists in today's world, I be- I personally believe it is the best because it does give you the more options. If you don't want to be a wage slave to corporations, then get you some education and set out on your own. That's something that you cannot do in capitalism. Um, one thing I, I pointed out into the chat for those viewing is that the only difference between fascism and communism is the fact of who owns the land. In fascism, the private individual is, is allowed to own the land, where in communism, the state. And the uh, both the means of production are controlled by the community, a.k.a. the state. So that's that's really where your big different that that's your big differences there in those economic models. Now that's not to say the social models; those are totally different, and that's something probably can be addressed in another deal. But honestly, get out there and grow something. It ain't hard. And it's I mean, easy. It's easy. It's easy for people who are able-bodied, though. Yes. Well, I mean, those who are they aren't able-bodied. They do have family members. They do have friends. I mean, let's be honest. What what I truly see wrong in the West is the fact that we don't talk to our neighbors. Uh, hey, geek, if you were my neighbor, I'd be sitting there going, "Hey, man, you need to borrow a cup of sugar or something." You know what I'm saying? You know, we're we're going to talk to each other, and if you're growing something and I'm growing something, man, we could rotate and we could help each other out. That sounds you like know, a commune to me. It's part yeah. of a commune, but if you own your own land, then you can control your own means of sustainment. Um, I think, and that that's really what I'm talking about. I think Ed Warren probably has something to say um, in regards to um, what you were saying just then. Um, but uh, just to uh, point out, um, when, um, just quickly uh, before we all discuss the other stuff I said, no one's saying you can't own like a plot of land under communism. The problem is primarily actually communism idea- states you cannot own the land uh, because it no, is no, owned. It's, by it's the idea of um, a corporation or an entity saying, "Right, this island's mine. This farm is mine entirely." Like, no, you, there's enough space for everyone to like own a house, uh, like a garden and stuff, where you could have a vegetable patch or something. No one's like saying that is the problem. Because you know, as society, societally like owned, therefore society is, de- society is delegated to you this bit of land to do stuff with. And if you want to have a little garden, then you can. What is being said, well, what isn't allowed, is for you to profit off that land. So for you to take the labour of other people and then profit off it. So imagine you grow these vegetables and then someone else comes along and takes them and sells them and makes a fortune off that. 
That okay, and, and that's a fair criticism. So let me let me pose this question to you. Uh, Owen, you're, you're the you're the big proponent for I'm assuming communism. Um, hold on, there we go. Thank you. Um, should you should you honestly weigh the skills and education of those who are like doctors equally to those who are high school dropouts? These are the things that you that needs to be considered because honestly, if you do not value skills and training and education above those who do not pursue such things, then honestly, you're advocating for slavery. If you're saying that there's no wages and you're saying that all their education, training and stuff is worthless. So now you're going to force people to provide services sans equivalent compensation now capitalism doesn't always do that okay let's be completely honest doctors are uh sometimes underpaid depending on who they work for you know but that may be by a choice of their own um as skilled labor may be under or overcompensated depending on where they are i mean but this this is something that if everyone is equal and everyone gets the same thing, then what motivation is there to move towards betterment, to move towards higher, higher goals? I'm sorry, but capitalism does offer the carrot. If you sit there and go, if you work hard, if you study, if you learn all this stuff, you get skills that all these other people don't, don't have, you can ultimately live a more comfortable life. So, um, and that's, that's something that I think is, is a true way to incentivize. Okay. Um, well, uh, I suppose um, you probably predicted this, but I fundamentally agree. I I'm trying to be concise as I can because I suspect um, everyone else wants to say something in um, most, what's most likely going to be criticism of what you've just said. Um, and that's completely fine. It, it, there's nothing wrong with criticism. Oh, of course. Um, so I'll try and be as quick as I can. Um, Let's see. Uh, doctors, um, yeah, they do an important role in society. And no one's saying they, um, they're worthless. But the fact they do their job and it helps people does not mean that other people are then um, should be barred from being able to access, you know, a home, um, healthcare, education, as we see under capitalism. Because, you know, a free market essentially says, oh, well, these people who um, produce profit are entitled to the fruits of life or the necessities of life that doctor is using tools created by other laborers that doctor's education came through the labor of others the doctor doesn't exist in a vacuum their labor and their um, role in society is not possible without the labor of everyone else who came before them um, and to isolate them from the people who delivered their equipment the person who trained them, the um, people producing their books they studied from is to you know ignore the entire uh, societal um, conditions that allow that doctor to become a doctor. So for them to then suddenly make um, a massive amount um, in a salary, whilst the rest of the workers who make their job possible are, you know, living on minimum wage or less, um, li living in miserable conditions, unable to escape their conditions, is fundamentally unfair. Um, and you also have to consider that it's not like, um, it's easy to say, oh, well, you know, doctors um, should be paid more than everyone else because they're more important. But, you know, it's, it's down to the free market. There's jobs like um, bin men, for instance. If, imagine if there were no um, bin men and removal vans. Um, and there's just rubbish everywhere on the streets. And, you know, there's this massive problem with waste. But they barely get paid anything. It's, very, it's often seen as quite a low-value job and a pretty unimportant role, um, waste management. But, you know, what happens to society if we just suddenly have all these problems? Look at food farmers and people who work on farms. Without their labour, all, so, all of a sudden your entire food network is um, you know, falling apart because you've got this abundance of food just not able to go anywhere. Yet these roles are taken um, as low-skilled, you know, um, oh, you go here if you aren't very smart jobs. You know, that's another example of if you didn't have this job, so much of society wouldn't be able to function. Yet because of capitalism's free market and because we've maximised profit off um, these uh, jobs, we're seeing like these jobs being unable to sort of being paid much. Um, you mentioned capitalism off offering the carrot. Like, again, as I mentioned earlier, it's a false like carrot because, you know, you have to um, sell your labor to your boss who's in is the boss's best interest to maximize profits off you. 
So, you know, you're not going to have a wage that allows you to do much with your um, capital apart from sell it to the capitalist who you're already, um, you know, selling your labour to. Um, so to say, oh, yeah, just um, get a plot of land, um, get a um, get some vegetables, start growing it. It's like, you, wh where's that time coming from? Because your, your time is going into selling your labour. And when it's not selling your labour to make money, it's eating or sleeping or anything else that essentially keeps you alive. You've maybe got a limited window of time to make this farm and plot of land, in which case you're like, you know, you don't want to be doing even more work. You want to be making like enjoy, trying to enjoy your life, what little time you have to um, relax a bit. Um, I think it's a little bit ignorant, really, of the conditions capitalism has to stay. Um, oh, you know, just um, work a little bit harder. I liked I, what you said earlier about people should talk to their neighbour. That's brilliant. That's what that's what communists want, really. That's what we want as um, leftists to make a society where people are happier. But that's antithetical to capitalism, where your your time is being poured into um, making more capital from your capital. So the scenario where you speak to Geek uh, Sparky and say, "Yeah, let's share our tools, let's help each other," that's not happening. The better capitalists would say, "No, let's you know cut Geek off. Let's try and make." our um, garden better so that we make more profit and thus have a better life than geeks so you know our um what we value as better behavior and like you know nicer you know speaking to our neighbor and stuff is what um the capitalists of you know mcdonald's nike and that said no let's forget that we want to make more money and so that's why they're at the top of the food chain because they've said let's profit and exploit our labor as much as we can to make ourselves as wealthy as we can which is why nike workers you know they live in um horrible sweatshops literally on the sweatshop campus because they have nowhere else to go and they can't leave their job otherwise they'll starve meanwhile nike is worth billions and their ceos like are some of the wealthiest people on the planet and stuff the whole system is fundamentally corrupt and like broken because it's based on the exploitation of labor the idea that people who do the work are merely commodities and their labor is a commodity to be profited off and I'm very sorry for rambling on because I'm sure everyone else has stuff to say. So I'll let, um, I don't know, Geek or um, anyone else chip in. To this I did want to like um, comment on something that the Aircraft Sparky said and like uh, many other capitalists have said that where they believe that you, you need to do, have like the incentives of money in order to do anything like in science or in art and, and or anything like that. And... I do not agree with that at all. I mean, I used to agree with that, but uh, in the last two years, or even just in the last year, I've kind of like changed my tune and said, no, not really. And uh, in fact, I got I remember a TED talk uh, years ago. I got to like find this TED talk where it's like the guy kind of like find uh, like a scientific experiment where it's our thought experiment of like the candle trick and stuff like that. And it figured out that the money incentive for a kind of job that requires a lot of thinking, a lot of like abstract thought, a lot of engineer thinking and stuff like that, money incentive doesn't work. It just doesn't. And I believe that especially in the arts and sciences, humanities and engineering and stuff like that, there'll be enough people that will do it for the love of doing it. I mean, you people who think that like it's capitalism that created the iPhone, but yet many of the technologies like the GPS and like the touch screens and all that stuff, those were created by state government funded uh, projects. And so it just for the, I believe that like it's, Science or any of those things, and even for pick up the garbage, there'll be people that don't mind picking up the garbage or love to pick up the garbage because it helps clean up the communities and stuff like that. And so there'll be people willing to do that. I do not believe that you need to pay people money in order to do things. If people are willing to do something, they'll be willing to do it, and they'll especially be willing to do it if they don't have to like spend 40 hours a week on a job that they don't like. Uh, quick response to that, uh, Geek. Just to let you know, I am a I'm an aircraft electrician. That's where I, that's where my name came from. Um, I can train almost anyone to do it. It's not a difficult job. Um, some of the principles behind it are quite abstract, but I mean, I can show real life ways to train people. That, that was a big part of my job. What makes me more highly paid than most people in the electrical field is the fact that if I make a mistake, I go to prison because that plane kills everyone inside of it and possibly whoever it lands on. And by land, I mean crash. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's safety concerns, there's liabilities, and that's what, that's what I'm talking about. Um, if there wasn't something to 
incentivize me to do it, I wouldn't do it. And I love, I love fixing airplanes. I actually call it a hobby. Um, I'm one of those people that have found a true calling in life, things that I love to do. Aviation is something that I thoroughly enjoy. Um, but not everyone has that option. And I don't know why they don't have that option. I don't fully comprehend it. Um, I blame it on poor choices for some people. Others are just, hey, you're in a bad, you're in a bad spot. You know, it's just you don't have way means to get there. Um, but I understand what you're saying. People who do love love to do things are going to do them regardless of incentive incentivization. But you're not going to be able to continue doing it if you can't live. And one of the biggest problems that I see, and uh, I, I look at the American uh, welfare system on this, is there's a lot of people who are just happy with the status quo. Um, they're content. They may not be happy, but they're content. And so they don't try to push themselves beyond what they currently are. I left the workforce for three years so I could pursue a, a degree. I used my GI Bill benefits to do that. Um, thank you, Uncle Sugar, you know, for allowing me the chance to give that blank check. And fortunately for me, they didn't cash it in, you know, but because of that, I had that benefit to go to college for free. Um, that option is open to multiple people in the military in the in the U.S. Uh, and only one percent of Americans will ever serve um, where there's probably about 60 percent of Americans that are able to serve and there's also uh, multiple grant programs and um, stuff that exist to help with that just to interject um oh she's yes. gone now but um goodbye i was just gonna say bye to ashley um oh sorry ashley goodbye it was nice talking with you yeah hopefully she'll be around bye, ashley. Good talking with you again um, next stream we do um sorry to cut you off there just uh for what i should say no no worries I, I was actually done i apologize for rambling i do uh, that no occasionally worries. um so i think um you mentioned a, uh, you know, it's nice. Um, you said, you know, it's a hobby of yours to fix um, engines and be an like, uh, electrician and stuff. And mm -hmm. um, I forget the specific uh, role it was, but it was like a mechanic sort of thing. I gather. I'm an aircraft electrician. I, I work on uh, power generation, lighting, avionics, radar, yeah. and also uh, pressurization and life support. Yeah. So um, that stuff, that field, um, aircraft, is something that is worth a lot in uh, society. So, for instance, planes are used in the military. One of the America's highest, um, like wealth, is, is certainly in America. Like it's a massive industry, um, the biggest in the world by far, um, and thus worth millions. And on top of that, you've got aircraft in, um, you know, airplanes and transportation, and just personal aircraft because you know that's a big field. That's something with a lot of money behind it. Therefore, your job is easier to be a hobby because it makes you enough to live off um quite comfortably i'd imagine because it's mm -hmm. quite a lucrative field whereas imagine someone pursuing art imagine it's someone who really enjoys singing or making um, games or um playing a sport if they they have a much harder task getting into a position where that hobby also meets a um living because their field is less um lucrative or like it doesn't sell, the labor doesn't sell for either anything or enough to live off, or the um, people who do actually make it to the top are so finite compared to those who want to be at the um, position. And, and that's fair. Um, I actually was a professional musician. Well, exactly. Like you, Three um... Doors Down was my opening band. <laughs> I don't, I, I literally, I grew up playing music. Um, and yes, not everyone makes it. I'm living proof. But that shouldn't um, mean that you should, you know, lose out on life. Like people who want to play the guitar but you know don't want to be some massive rock star. That's all right. You should be able to just enjoy playing in the newsroom. That's, that's a great thing. Mm -hmm. But people lose out from that because they have to devote their time to selling their labor because otherwise they won't have what it, they won't have um, the money to buy the essentials in life and stuff. When society doesn't have to be that way. Imagine if instead of being told no, you ne you're never gonna make it as a guitarist unless you're incredibly lucky give it up and just sell labor elsewhere. People got told, well, you know, you, you might not become the next um, Bruce Springsteen, but, you you know, just keep it up because you might enjoy it. And there wasn't that pressure to sell your labor because all of a sudden society doesn't run on the idea that workers should sell their labor to the capitalist to, like, to get in return the basics of society. Um, you, you, know, you mentioned um, earlier... Actually, no, sorry, um, Geek mentioned uh, the... Uh, uh, sorry, just to inject myself. Yes, Rose is still here. She's just muted. 
Um, but yeah, um, Geek mentioned um, the incentive of money um, not actually being a thing for a lot of people in industries. And not only is that true, but money actually in some cases ruins some industries. Like you look at the control that some corporations have over industries like the arts um, and how it's essentially got Hollywood um, and other major studios into producing just sequels of the same films or TV shows that go nowhere, but as um, opportunities for corporations to make more money and like um, sponsors to rack off um, um, massive things. Um, ma massive franchises and stuff. Uh, you look at the way um, video games, for instance, like you look at the way EA are managing um, sports franchises or you know, Ubisoft are treating their franchises, and it's atrocious. Meanwhile, small people who have really good ideas have no chance of ever making a flat get um, a, a headway into it because their ideas threaten the wealth of larger corporations. And, you know, it's easy to say, oh, well, you know, that's just the effect of um, unimportant things. But look at really important things like healthcare. American healthcare corporations hold back cures and treatment for some diseases because it's more profitable to make more people buy antibiotics to try treat their, you know, the art of the um, symptoms rather than address the actual problem. Um, for healthcare itself, like the fact you have to pay to get even access to it. That's actively making the population unhealthy and actually killing people. I mean, even now you look at the flu epidemic that's sort of starting in america there's no reason for that to be happening like you could so easily address that if you just let people access basic healthcare but that's not profitable so um that's you know not going to happen um and you know we also have to consider automation as well people selling their labor hours isn't gonna cut it in a world where we've got machines that can do the job of um, what was previously thousands of workers. Look at a dockyard, for instance. What was once hundreds of workers lugging um, cargo around the bay is now one person operating in like a hundred, like one or two machines to lift dozens of containers every hour. Like that's, you know, that shows that society needs a new system to replace the one that means you must sell your labor to survive. We've got to adapt and capitalism isn't capable of that because it fundamentally requires you to sell your labor as a commodity on the free market. Anyway, I'm rambling again. So, um, Wolf, you were going to say something about the arts. Oh, yes. Uh, the, what, the one video that I kind of, um, that it kind of inspired me to go on a rant was, you know, I was watching, you know, Paul Joseph Watson do this video about the arts. And this is pretty much like, um, you know, word for word. It's pretty much what he's saying. It's like, um, you know, this painting is bullshit because of these regressive social justice warrior virtue signalers who tell me to check my male privilege and it's like it's nothing to do with it like, sorry that was a really bad accent but it's that similar um thing like that's not the cause of it at all it's this elitism that goes on with these art galleries i mean um because it's kind of the it is very much an elitism it's kind of tied to capitalism a little bit the way they do that um, so I sort of disagree with what Paul Joseph was saying about the, about the arts because it's really tied to the elite and the people at the top, you know, they're choosing these works of art that are very, very abstract and the average people probably wouldn't be able to understand. They use a language that's impenetrable for the public and in a cultural way, it's like the, um, it's kind of a Marxist thing that, you know, it's a collective, I guess it's a collective, not ownership, but a collective awareness of culture and you know, artistic trends, and, you know, we're not going to see the everyday populace, the, um, you're not going to see their, um, what the type of art they want to see, um, you know, displayed in museums where sort of the elite are the ones who are picking the artwork, so that's sort of a load of bullshit how the Paul Joseph Watson tries to spin it. Mm. Yeah. No, I completely agree, actually. Like, the idea that um, <coughs> art is determined, or the worth of art is determined by a free market is so disgusting. Like, imagine what we would have lost if what was popular, like, 100 years ago was, like, correct, because it was just popular and, like, the wealthy liked it. Imagine the composers we'd have lost um, if, um, you know, the ruling class had just said, oh, well, you know, your music is not what we want to listen to. Um, imagine if uh, the films we consider, like, amazing today were just rendered worthless because... Um, they weren't as profitable as other films of the time. Like, the idea that art is <laughs> something that 
should be um, just like based on profit and stuff and something that is determined by um, how much money it makes or essentially how much it can produce in the capitalist class is so gross in my opinion because like you said it contains art that is otherwise abstract and um, maybe like not um, unique to a certain field like niche um, genres and stuff it curtails it because all of a sudden it's not profitable it's not got a um, widespread audience and now suddenly yeah. it's dying out so you see people have to divulge in oh, sorry you, you, you want to say something um, we'll yeah I was like because I think you were mentioning the music industry as well and, and that's the thing that um like I kind of got irritated with the Twitter like with the feeds when they were talking about the Grammys and I'm thinking like all of these people are in the Grammy like they're all there because they've sold heaps of records and they've all made it they're rich they're famous they've done exactly what they wanted to and I, like, I know it seems wrong, but, you know, I've got no time for all these hashtags about complaining about who won the Emmys or the politics or whatever. Like, my only, my biggest concern is with the struggling musicians who are probably uh, ten times more talented than these mm. people are up on the stage. But it's um, like they have to work in a cafe just so they can pay to go to a gig. And even though they've got, like, infinitely, like, more talent and originality, it's just they're not given the break. Whereas these people at the top, they've been given these breaks and... Some of the yeah, some of the um, social justice activism, like it's some of it still concerns itself with a kind of yucky bourgeois type protection of the upper class. Yeah, well, no, exactly. I think what you're saying about um, the like, idea of musicians who are smaller, like not having the chance, despite like being more talented than a lot of people at the big um, you know, award ceremonies, it's so true. Like, imagine go, you can go to your local theatre and you'll see people who are really talented, really work hard some of the most like down to earth amazing people you'll ever meet but they're never going to be as big as um you know johnny depp's the um angelina jolie's because you know they've not got the big companies behind them like you like you said musicians like it doesn't matter how well you play the guitar if you come having to compete with like a sony or a paramount or like another massive um music producer you're not gonna have that um like a realistic chance like, unless you get lucky and your song goes maybe viral or something you're never going to be recognised, um, just as I'm saying that. Um, a very dead horse joins the chat. How are you, um, horse? How was your birthday? How was your birthday the other day? Um, <laughs> it was great. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you did. You uh, did you see what uh, the the tweet said right after you commented? On I, I don't that? think so. Uh, <laughs> so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll tell you exactly what it said real quick. Um, so you said uh, I, don't, I don't remember exactly what uh you were talking about something about capitalism and i kind of kind of poked and prodded you about it and uh and uh actually continue just go ahead and continue I'm, I'm gonna find the tweet real quick and i'll just share it real quick you guys continue what you're, what you're oh, talking about no i didn't mean to interrupt and stop everything here no worries i'm sure it was enlightened evil a horse um anyway <laughs> but yeah like the um People who work with um, companies and corporations that have far larger um, capital and wealth than others are always going to have the other hand, regardless of their talent, um, because they've got the financial might to control advertising, control um, their time in the spotlight, control where they get to go. Like you look at the Grammys, for instance. Like you're not going to get like um, front seat um, bidding and stuff, and you know, not like center stage if you're not um, exceedingly wealthy um wolf uh you've been excellent today i, I completely disagree with that <laughs> um now um certainly you know you gotta um look at the conditions that um affect society um and to come back to what i was saying um a while ago these people who don't um necessarily have the um weight of uh, someone like ed sheeran or something shouldn't be barred from pursuing something they're actively good at just because of the um, in fact, their labour hasn't produced as much profit for the capitalist class. I think we've got a fundamental problem in society if we base people's worth on how much money they make for other people. Um, and you know that ultimately comes down to any aspect of um, capitalism. I feel like it's such a um, broad criticism of the system but, um, and encompasses so much of our society that if we can see it as negative on one element, like the arts or like video games, um, we should be able to see it for all elements of society. Like, it's something that affects everything. 
and the that, Owen, um, you uh, you live in the UK, correct? Yeah. Okay. This is son of kind of a Londoner accent you have going on. Um, so over there, over there, there is um some form of universal health care. Um, it's not completely a hundred percent like what you would see in the Scandinavian countries. I understand that. Um, let me ask you this: um, Why is it that you see cancer patients, or like uh, I can't remember the baby's name, the Charlie, whatever, um, that was essentially killed by the UK government? Why were they denied? Um, why why do you see cancer patients in the UK fly to the US for treatment? You also see this coming out of Canada. Um, why do you see a baby being sentenced to death by uh, high UK courts for now not allowing their parents who raised the money to pay for their children to go to the US to get treatment? Potentially life-saving, potentially not. We, we can debate that. Uh, but why is there rationing? Why is there such such rationing in the UK? Which it, I mean, this is a socialized healthcare it, plan, um, and it's still it's failing. It's failing its people. Okay. Um, so firstly, it's not actually um, socialized. Uh, it's um, there is the um, healthcare system that is national, but it's partly privatized as well. So for instance, then. Um, dental care is private um, and if you're over 18 you have to pay for uh, dentist, dentistry which is um, pretty horrific but um, to come back to um, what you were saying um, the NHS in our country has been and as many parts of our nation have been uh, subjected to you uh, have been privatized and is in the process of um, severe defunding from the conservative government um, which is leading to the eventual privatization or what they hope will be the privatization of it. So, for instance, we saw this with um, railways, with uh, transportation, with energy. Um, and it's a classic um, tactic and, of neoliberalism and a idea and process which is sort of inherent to capitalism's eventual decline um, of growth and stuff. So when the um, when growth dries up, when profits are harder to come by, um, you start defunding the um, functions of states and eventually privatizing them. So the NHS is being privatized, so it's having less money poured into it, which means hospitals are being overrun, um, they got understaffed, uh, there's not enough um, doctors to see everyone, there's people waiting in A&E for um, horrific amounts of time, and then the government then says, oh, well, you know, the system's not working, we need to privatize it, we need to put a free market in. Um, and then hopefully the conservatives are well not hopefully hopefully for the conservatives they'll move to a more american style system where you have to pay to access it where you have to pay for everything um so if this, if this was a proper um socialist system this problem would never arise because the uk is clearly wealthy enough to afford everyone um a sustainable healthcare to have um hospital and a doctor near every single person who needs it have a system where your needs are addressed and you know, there's no like waiting stupid times in a um, you know, an A&E to being seen. Um, the problems you describe are absolutely problems. They're problems caused of capitalism and its inherent like devaluing of critical elements of society in order to produce profit. Um, and as, as we're seeing, capitalism is no longer in um, its growth period. It's in its decay, quite clearly. Um, <laughs> it's going to you know, cause problems um, where elements of society are um, defunded. It's why, it's why the, um, so the welfare state um, benefits and stuff, that's been cut. It's why disability benefits has been massively targeted and um, it's an absolute like, disgrace what's going on with, um, uh, you know, the, um, people who are on disability benefits and access, um, which I'm sure, Ted, you could probably elaborate on, definitely. Um, yeah, should I? Was that an invitation? Um, yeah, no, definitely. I think I feel like you'd be um more qualified to uh talk about that side yeah. if you don't mind me saying that, of course. Well, right now I'm in the process of applying for this new benefit. They've changed it to it. You still be something of disability living allowance, which quite rightly most disabled people severe enough God. Now it's this thing of personal 
independence fund which is more according to how independent you are. But the trouble is independence is such an abstract thing. You can't really quantify it. And to be able to go from person to person. So basically, they're trying to find a way to prove you don't need the benefits. And that's what capitalism does. It pollutes everything. It makes it all evil. Exactly. Um, the idea that um, people who aren't able to sell their labour are just, you know, um, lying about it and you need to prove that then the idea of the organisations um, and the change from the, the uh, benefit system to make it so that um, disabled people have to, like, to prove they are unable to be independent um, and be in the situations um, where, you know, sometimes they clearly need that funding, they're denied it because um, the capitalist class and the capitalist system has said, no, well, you um, you can still produce profit. And it's clearly inhumane, because if you look at the um, statistics for what's happened for a lot of disabled people, it's caused literal death. It's causing people to like be in a situation where they're having to work, despite being not fit to work, um, not in a, any condition to do it, be it either mentally or physically, and causing them to literally die. Um, that's what's yeah. going on in the... Yeah, exactly. That's what's going on in the UK, because of the capitalism's inevitable decline and the capitalist class trying to protect their profits over people. That's inherent to capitalism. Capitalism, even. Um, also, uh, the quick, the Sean on the channel, uh, Sean did a video not too long ago about the privatization of the train system in the UK. And so if you want to know more about that specific issue of how the privatization of a public service of the train system and how that affected the UK and how it doesn't work, uh, Sean um, did a great video on that. Yeah, I think in, in many ways, the UK is an example of not just how capitalism is bad, but also how a system with capitalism and elements of other systems is also flawed. Because whilst you have systems that are good, they're eventually going to be consumed by capitalism. They're going to be like taken away and stripped down of their good elements to make more profit or to protect the profit and status of the wealthy. So like the NHS, for instance, which um, is fundamentally light years ahead of American healthcare, but is in real crisis at the moment because capitalism will eventually consume it and, um, you know, is turning it into a for-profit system. Um, and, you know, near, um, we're seeing the implications of this every day with headlines like people, um, you know, having to wait hours and hours in A&E, like um, hospital wards where there aren't enough beds per patient. Um, and this is all because of capitalism, because we value profits over people. So naturally, it's um, the capitalist class are going to protect their own wealth over the conditions of others. So to come back to what you were saying, oh, right, yeah. Mark Barkey, health, Just, um, oh, the fact sorry. the NHS is suffering is because of capitalism, directly because of capitalism. And you were going to say something, Rose. Yeah, I was going to um, say something about healthcare. Like you brought up um, people having to, you know, like wait for hours, you know, for stuff that's like very necessary and sometimes like really urgent. And, um, you know, like hearing that coming out of the UK, oh, I think that. this is like, I think it's like a really bad situation. Like for me as an American, if like hearing about that coming out of the UK um have it or you know and not being like j just kind of thinking oh this is exactly what i've gone through this is stuff that like i've seen i just assumed this happened everywhere else that Sorry. this is just the norm so to interject um once i was about to say um goodbye to uh wolf um bye wolf oh, i'll chat later. later what once again i was See too late <laughs> oh, i'm sorry <laughs> no worries um yeah wolf um it was great having you and um, hopefully uh, we can stream again Anyway, continue, Rose. But yeah, I just thought that it 
it, it's very important to like realize too that like you know for you know a lot of poor people in america what you're describing happening with the nhs and how um you know waiting times are going up because of um privatization i mean if you're poor in america like if you come from like you know, inner city for, or, you know, you come from an inner city, you come from, or just like the city in general, um, and you come from a poor background, um, you're just kind of used to needing to wait there in healthcare, or at least that has been my experience. Mm. You know, I've, so I've severely injured myself, but still had to wait four hours just to be seen by a doctor in a nearly empty hospital before. Well, I think it says something of capitalism uh, that it's actually a privilege to wait for healthcare at all instead of not receive it. Like there's people who actively avoid hospitals and avoid getting their needs met because it will cost and that will contribute to them missing meals or not being able to pay rent. Like the fact that people have to weigh up valuable parts of their life and decide whether they're more important is something that takes place every day under capitalism. There's, there's millions of Americans and people in the West missing meals to afford their rent. There's millions of people in America um, suffering from really easily treatable illnesses and diseases that don't have access to that treatment because it will cost them and won't be able to afford the other elements of their life. Now, Owen, there are people in Venezuela right now who are missing meals because the bread lines don't have any. Um, there's people in Argentina that are waiting exorbitant amount of times in order to get health care because there aren't enough doctors. Uh, you can't sit there and just blame it strictly on capitalism. The reality yeah, yeah. is supply and demand is a real thing. Okay. If you don't have enough doctors, if you have more patients and you have doc, you know, have doctors, you're going to have slow, uh, you're going to have a bottleneck feature in the service provided. Um, when it comes to access, everyone has access in America to healthcare. Now they may not have the means to pay for it. And that is where people get wrapped around the axle. Um, there are a multitude of ways in order to get funding for most health care. Now, for non-essential health care, sorry if you need a boob job. That's really not going to happen through <laughs> a lot of means. But if, you um, <laughs> if, you're looking, if you're looking for actual necessary health care um, needs, there are ways to raise money. There's actual grants. There's, um, there's actually some insurance, which I, I really have been looking into lately. It's where... You get, um, it's kind of like the idea of like Obamacare started out with in practice, in actual theory, but all it is is people agreeing, hey, we're going to pay X amount and however much is being pulled out of the, out of the pool, uh, we'll pay for it. Um, there's been some problems that I've run across um, and I, I'm still not done researching all of it. So it, it's kind of hit and miss. If I could pop in, I, I, I know what, I know what you're talking about. There's a, uh, I, they, usually it's like a Christian based thing, but um, yeah. I mean, I'm sure there's other different, different versions and where basically they pay a certain amount a month and then they, they're like, Oh, well this person really needs this. And so we're going to give this month's to this person and they're going to get, you know, whatever money that we've collected or whatever. Um, but another reason why they've got, uh, while we've got so many, the waiting time in the emergency rooms is uh, we've got people coming in with the sniffles yeah, and they're in line, they're in line, uh, you know, five people ahead of someone who's got a hole in their hand, <laughs> like what happened to me. And so there's a, a lady with a kidney stone who is literally sitting there drinking like a huge thing of Mountain Dew <laughs> well, I'm waiting with uh, a big hole in my hand and a lady with the sniffles and, and you know, a few other things. So it's not, it's not just a, um, it's not as black and white yeah. as you're and, and one thing, as you're trying to explain it. One thing that I like to, that I like to say, um, oh, and you haven't probably seen any of my stuff. Um, you have mentioned one word. You have said the F word over and over. Fair. There is no such thing as fair. Fair is fair is a pipe dream that we teach our children in order to play nice with each other. Uh, the reality is, is the world is not fair. And isn't that now because there of is, capitalism? 
Um, no, because it doesn't matter if it's I in a non capitalist society. I mean, have you been to non capitalist societies and noticed that things aren't fair? I have. <laughs> They're even less fair. <laughs> I mean, but, um, go to Saudi Arabia as an Indian and, you know, as a red dot Saudi Indian, Arabia. find out how fair it is. Um, go to, go down to Argentina and see how fair it is down Argentina there, Peru. Um, um, go to Thailand. It's fair is, like, fair Thailand is a nice dream, capital. but it's not a reality is the problem. Uh, under capitalism, that's true. Well, um, no, 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 no. Non-capitalist countries, you still see the same effect. People are corrupt. People are inherently selfish. Okay. So well, hold on, well, hold on one second. I, I need, I'm going to ask Owen this because the way every time that you're questioned about one of these other countries that we say are not capitalist, you say that they are capitalist, and every time that we say, well, this is not a capitalist society. This is a communist society. You say it's a capitalist society. So I get really confused as to where your baseline as of because his his argument isn't, is the fact that communism has never been done properly. Okay. I know, but it, it, it's obviously something. But I'm trying to figure out. It's not capitalism because communism isn't capitalism, and obviously, you know, there's a bunch of, you know, varying degrees of not quite capitalism and kind of capitalism and capitalism. Uh, I mean, basically, you know, fascist forms of, you know, fascist takeovers of capitalism where part of the society is capitalistic and other parts have been taken over by the government. So like, I, I, I kind of need to know your base. When you think of capitalism, wh what do you think of? And when you think of, the closest thing to what you would say is a socialistic society or a communistic society. I need to know what that is like in your brain. Like, okay. So when we describe capitalism, we describe the um, private ownership of um, the means of production. So that's like, you know, the tools of which society is built. Um, and then in private hands, we talk about the profiting of, um, of commodities to accrue more capital. So the idea that you, uh, take what you have and make more with what you have um, by selling commodities for a higher price at which you attain them from to make more capital for yourself. And that's a system which the vast majority of the countries in the world use um, bar like a few. But the fact that they aren't capitalists does not mean they are communist. Communism is uh, sort of like the opposite of this, the idea that um, workers and thus society, the people in society as a collective should own everything. Thus, the ab abolition of class, the abolition of the states, the idea that has that ever is... existed? Sorry, has that ever existed? Well, no, because you can't no. have a um, stateless society in a society with so like there's no. Okay, um, so it, you're the... even admitting that it's a pipe dream. But so the the dream of Marx, the, the dream of Marx, what even Marx determined not, to be that's not un a unobtainable thing. It's a pipe dream. That's saying that it's not existed yet, like. That's, that's like saying, well, how, uh, how would it exist? How would we get there? The workers of the world overthrow the capitalist class. They seize the means of production from the ruling class, which have possession of them, and thus make a society in which everyone is able to live without having to sell their labor, in which the tools of which we have more, the, autom the automation process, the abundance of resources we have, are controlled by society as a whole. Like, that's not okay. a pipe dream. That's something that's quite easily achievable. Okay, that's well, okay. then, okay, now let me ask you this, Owen, just to follow up. How how should um, things such as social loafing be um, addressed then? In a socialist society, in a, in a purely socialist society, there is a, there's a deal that you see, especially in social sciences, where they talk about social loafing. Um, how is social loafing handled in a social in a what social mean, society. what do you mean by social loafing social loafing means that have you ever worked in a group and you had that one guy that's like yeah man i'll just let you i'll just let you handle this you got this man you know you're doing such a great job and they just kind of sit off in the corner and do Chill. nothing <laughs> and so that, that is social loafing that, so how is that handled apply that to society though like what no you have to apply that to society because you see that in society it's quite often it's it's rampant in society so how is that addressed? Because in capitalism, the way that it's addressed is they starve. But the um the social <laughs> they get fired. 
social loafing is done by the uh, wealthy because um, if you notice, um, the wealthy no the old, no. <laughs> no not at all. Yes. No wealthy yes. person yes. does nothing. I will tell you this: unless they are, unless don't they know are the people. the Anderson Coopers of the world who doesn't have to work, who is Van, who's a Vanderbilt. Um, no, um, my uncle is a CEO at a ship at a shipyard. Okay, um, he puts in sixteen hours a day. Six days a week. He can't make his money without the labor of everyone else underneath him. No, he can't. But you know what? He's also putting in hella hours. He is constantly working. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, but what you don't understand is executives, if... people who are widely successful, they are putting in the work as well. It is not it all these people putting in all the work and them doing nothing. If no, there's constant work. Their employees are responsible for their wealth. So why should they be wealthier than all their employees? Their employees they are helping they're managing the entire company. They yeah, are helping their employees where a worker, become where wealthy. One worker may be working on one little project, an executive is working on the entire company. But so they, it doesn't have to the, that, that doesn't have to be to towards just one person. One person doesn't have to just like manage all a bunch of different projects. That can be shared communally. No. Yeah. Because well, okay, so well, you're still going to have a deal community with a, leader. Because people aren't going to negotiate with a community. That's really hold, the hold deal. on one sec. It, even with that, you're going to have to have a community leader. That community leader is essentially the boss. No, so you're, you're not, not doing anything. You know, you're just why changing do you need one names person as a leader. Why do you need one person? You don't need one person, but you need a smaller group as the leader. And the reason why is because you can't sit there and let's say let's say we're all one big commune right here. And um, I'm an outsider. I'm definitely an outsider in this commune, and that's fine. Okay? I like you guys. I'm going to come over and talk. So I go over and talk to Geek, and I go, hey, Geek, butter. Bro, let's uh let's talk about you know this kind of trade. And Geek says, sounds like a great idea. We we move on and I come back next week, but hey, Geek isn't there because Geek is sick and now I have talked to you, Owen, and I'm like, hey, I talked to Geek about this, blah, blah, blah. We came to this agreement and you said, well, I don't fully agree with that. You know, no, you have to have, you have to have cohesion. You have to have continuity and that's why there's usually a smaller group of people that lead in any society. That's really more about continuity. So everyone is kind of on the same page. There's a direction that things are pointed into. And that if comes about have, naturally. So Yeah. But that doesn't necessarily mean you have a tiered ranking of society. And also... <laughs> that even happens It'll evolve with into that, though. It will evolve into that, though. But it won't. I don't see it. I don't think it has to. But it won't. Well, if, you abol- if you remove the you know, class structure that has predetermined society under capitalism, if you remove the idea that um, you know, um, life is a series of commodities to be profited off, You've moved the elements that allow groups in society to take control, as we see under capitalism. To go back to what you were saying, Sparky, about the um, you know the dockyard worker who doc, sorry dockyard um, business owner who you know, comes up with all these ideas. I mean, firstly, that's not necessarily true because if you look at what no, he doesn't do in, it all on his own. I'm not pretending like exactly, he does. Yeah, exactly. So why it is even if he thought of every single innovative you know great idea. If he requires the work of ev- all these workers to make his dream possible, from the people who get the materials to those who make it, to those who um, sell the ships, to those who sell his products elsewhere, why should they receive the, in- the produce of their labor, receive the profits from the labor, to receive the, in- to, in, like, the entire um, wealth from it? And then the workers who are every bit as responsible as the boss, in fact, the people who do the work, receive none of that. And that's the same with anything. Why should for instance, a company like Nike be um, able to have its wealth go to its shareholders Nike. and the people at the top. Not, not, oh, <laughs> Sorry. Well, okay, okay. The reason why is because ultimately in the grand scheme, when you look at it, it's it's about uh, the breadth of responsibility. Yeah, it's but, really uh, where, where it boils down Hold on one to. second. Uh, Ted? Ted? I, I remember, I remember to four sleepers, <laughs> four to three in the morning. Oh, yeah, no, it's yeah I mean, late. it's, yeah, it's like three fifteen over there. I mean, I it's late to... over. Yeah, I mean, it's like late over here. Um, it's like seven for geek. Yeah, it's like seven fifteen. Yeah. I'm gonna start. Have to start dinner soon. 
But uh, okay, well, it looks like we're gonna, we're we're closing this up. Hey, um, as a newcomer to this group, thank you. And Ted, Ted, I love you, dude. Good times. Oh, son, you Have can keep, you, you can keep talking without me. Did you oh, mean to? Oh, it's okay. I mean, well, I'm it's getting late over there, buddy. Anyway, because it's I mean, we're we're in the same time zone, Ted, and it's like I, I'm I'm getting pretty tired myself. So, so before uh, Ted, uh, Piper, do you still want to like say something? You've been interested to say something. Oh gosh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Buddy. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So like Venezuela got brought, and this is we kind of moved moved past this a little bit, but Venezuela got brought up, and I've been itching to say something about that since then. So when people bring up socialism in any way uh the common like there's a common response of oh well it's, you know that the you know, that's what's happening in venezuela venezuela socialism so if you want socialism just look at venezuela uh but that's i mean it's just wrong so like yeah. venezuela is not a non-capitalist society is a capitalist society the only thing that like the the fundamental like order of society the social order never actually changed what changed was that they had a regime change so basically uh chavez was elected into power and that meant that the uh the old government which was primarily a puppet government of uh the united states and western countries uh was no longer in power and now chavez was in power and you know Chavez, and then his legacy with Maduro has been, you know, you know, uh, opposed in some form to you know the United States and Western powers and their authority in Latin America. That's been what's happened. It's not you know capitalism hasn't left Venezuela, and yeah. it's yeah. this but, point is highlighted by the fact that the reason that Venezuela now they don't they 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 do have shortages in specific necessary products. But there are also many other consumer products available. But the shortages that are caused, that do exist, of things like toilet paper, uh, those are caused by companies that oppose the Maduro government. Uh, and so basically, they impose, they, you know, they basically refuse to put those products up for sale on the market to try to, you know, shock the government into, you know, doing what they want. Well, is there any true socialist um, society today is, is really the question I would, that I would ultimately have. Sorry to uh, bypass that question quickly, Spike. I'll come back to it in a second mm -hmm. and short as well. But this is the classic tactic of America and American like imperialism and capitalism to ruin and sabotage any attempts to stray even slightly from the method of capitalism. The crimes of America globally are easy to read about and very well documented. Um, and you know, any time... Um, a country tries to move away from something that directly benefits American profits. America swoops in and either you know sabotages the government, stages a coup, outright invades, and you can see this across Latin America. The Americans are blocking, or not Americans, and the American government is blocking aid to Venezuela. Like the fact that that's happening is proof that capitalism and its, and its propagators are it's in its best interest to ruin any attempts to stray from it because if they you know if people see that um if a, a nation that isn't following the norms is doing all right then they're gonna have problems which isn't to say that venezuela you know was socialist or was a good nation because no it's you know clearly like it's it had a massive private sector it was run by a political class it, you know it's clearly not socialist like it clearly doesn't follow the major tenets of socialism like the fact they um, nationalized a few things doesn't mean that it wasn't still in control of a political class. It still had a class system. It still had the idea of selling your labor, you know, to make a living. Like the fact you still have all those things means it's clearly not socialist. Um, no. no. But, you know, that, um, that still doesn't I... mean that the problems today are more complex than just, oh, yeah, not capitalism equals poverty and badness. I have. I also want to point out that I'm not like trying to apologize for the regime in Venezuela or something. I was just yeah. pointing out like, why the argumentative tactic of "oh well, look at Venezuela" doesn't really work. Anyway. Yeah. No, well, I mean that's just the most recent socialist uh, country that uh, I can think of. That's the only reason why I brought it up. Yeah. 
Well, yeah. Well, but uh, like, no, it's not even purely well, socialist. Well, I, yeah, what I want to know is, is there a purely socialist government that exists today in the world? Well, if it was purely socialist, they wouldn't have a government, which is sort of a point we're trying to get. There's no, like... Uh, the system we advocate for is that you know the class system the idea that we need a ruling class is you know moved on with because workers are capable of self-management you don't need to elevate a class of people to have power no they're not <laughs> sorry i'm sorry they're not they're really not um i've worked uh, i've worked so many different jobs uh, with so many different people um some people are capable of self-management about definitely not at all least that. half of them aren't capable of self-management some people are highly motivated some people don't need a boss and could see their boss maybe once a month and be totally fine uh some people if they don't see their boss for an hour they're doing nothing for that hour <laughs> that's not what i quite or what that's not quite what we mean by when we say work i, I, I like, get it I, yeah i know what you mean but some people are just inherently lazy and the things that that motivate them to stay t task oriented or um, to, to stay task oriented or do a good job are the benefits are the um, let's see. So like we used to have this program uh, at a place I used to work where uh, employees would get um, certain electronics and I'm echoing. Is somebody unplugged their headphones or something? Sorry. Okay, sorry. <laughs> it was, I was hearing myself back in my ear, and I'm like, ah, oh, this sounds weird. Um, so, like, we they would give away a certain um, electronic device, usually like a, like, sometimes it would be like something like an iPad or something for the employee of the month. The employee would work, and everybody who was motivated would bust their butt to get this thing. And, you know, in addition to those people would uh, also be, more they would out they put out more production they would uh they would be there on time they would it's, so when when that's that's oh th this kind of correlates to what, what what i was coming in when you asked about my birthday uh i found the tweet <laughs> uh you had said something to the effect of um the the quote was there is no incentive in in uh there is no incentive under communism and and you put that in quotations and you say then stay home and stay home in your house and sulk the rest of us will be liberated from the um and i, I can't read it because it cut off on here but uh, as soon as you had said that i said well it really I, I quote tweeted it and said well it must be my birthday and this and this makes me laugh a lot so thanks owen and as soon as i had said it was my birthday a, a place called Medieval Times quoted underneath, uh, uh, commented under <laughs> underneath the actual commented actual underneath the actual thing and said, "Celebrate his celebrate this birthday like kings and queens and feast for a discount." And then they left me a uh, a um, a coupon code and a uh, a uh, um, a link underneath. And I was just and my response to that was, "Ha, thanks. Uh, God bless capitalism." So <laughs> that was that was what I was trying to see if you actually saw the other day, and uh, it made oh, made my day that. really happy. <laughs> well, I'm glad your birthday was made, of course. Um, <laughs> At your anyway. expense, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. Anyway, anyway um, what was I going to say? Um, you were talking about laziness and the idea that people are inherently lazy, and I completely disagree. I think that yeah, some people you know they don't they're not suited as such to certain workplaces. But this idea of laziness and that people are you know they're lazy, so they have to be have given a boss and given people to you know guide them or force them into doing certain tasks is one that's grafted of you know capitalist ideas and ideals about how the workers should behave. So for instance, um, you're lazy if you don't work and if you just stay in bed and stuff. That's essentially saying you're bad if you aren't selling your labor hours to the capitalist. You're bad if you aren't making ruling class more wealth. You know, you notice how this isn't applied to saying. No, it just means you're well, wasting okay. your life. But, but okay, <laughs> so a follow up to that, Owen. Uh, oh, if you just let me finish this and then you can go yeah. something to Bucky. Um, 
like you don't see this applied to those at the upper class who do very little but essentially you know socialize with their friends and don't contribute to anything by their <laughs> but own they don't, they don't and they don't you know, do very little sense. sorry they, they don't do. do very little is what i'm what was my point like the wealthy uh, people who okay. like you know okay. just loaded and how like, much you have things. so you have next uh, mobile does I'm sorry, Piper. Go ahead, man. Uh, how much do you think the CEO of Exxon Mobil does? A lot. <sighs> I'm sure he has meetings pretty much all day long. Uh, I'm sure he has to be people to run numbers. Uh, he has to send people to do things. He has to. I mean, okay. So, one of my former employers is a multimillionaire, and he started out on a card table in someone's house and someone is echoing again. Damn it. Um, the, and he has built his business from literally nothing to driving Maseratis. So, and I know the, every single process of this dude working 16 hours a day, busting his butt so that he can get back to working just eight. And sometimes it's usually not even just eight. He's still working 10 hours a day. But he has, you have to delegate. That's what, that's what a, a boss does. That's what millionaires do. They delegate their responsibilities because they want to they have a bigger vision of what they want to get done. Right. So they, they'll find, they'll like someone who maybe couldn't, doesn't have the, the, the means to invent something or, uh, you know, do his own thing necessarily at the moment. This he can hire this this particular person, and if this person can take orders and can um, you know write things down, has a good memory, and can show up on time, he can make this other dude more more, uh, more money, and then thus making it helps both of them out i mean it's oh. not like it, it's i, I used you, you make it sound like it's completely like this person's a slave to capitalism uh, yeah, but case. my former boss yeah, i mean he he has helped so many people with what he specifically does hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people but and we are, we're looking at the whole system not just one case by case individual but we got to remember that they were a millionaire yes, but then they but, still fall the you know, produce of their labor. They made themselves vastly wealthier than the people. They made in other people Can vastly wealthier. Can I add a quick thing? Yeah. So, like, you can talk about uh, individuals who are rich for whatever reason. So you could talk yeah. about, I don't know, football players or something. Or you could talk about uh, somebody who's made a lot of money doing uh, YouTube videos or whatever you want to, you know, you could even talk about the upper level of management in a company. Uh, but when you when you talk about the people who, you know, the actual capitalists, the people who own uh, enterprises, specifically large enterprises like large corporations, those are shareholders. And they own those companies because they have shares in those companies. They have a majority share. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that uh, their share entitles them to a large check of money that comes in the mail every month. And yeah. when they go outside of their house and they walk down to their mailbox and they take the, you know, the, the, you know, the little postcard with the, with the check in it, uh, that's the work that they're doing. Uh, the, yeah, okay. the rest of the work is done by <laughs> upper, the rest of the work. Can I finish? Thank you. The rest okay. of the work is being done by upper mid-level uh, mm. upper and mid-level management and then the workers who are paid wages by that enterprise uh the people that actually own you know enterprises capitalists uh have gotten in you know have started you know basically you farming out even the work that they may have had to do so things mm. like marketing uh to yeah. upper level management so the idea that like I'm making boss. everyone else money. <laughs> no, but it's not, though, is it? Because if it was actually, like... Because, you know, imagine, like, if the person who ran McDonald's was going to, you know, look after their workers, you wouldn't see people in sweatshops and um, horrid, like, what slave-like conditions across the world making the CEOs of McDonald's and, like, shareholders and stuff billions. 
like that wouldn't be happening. But instead, people at the top of the corporation are you know living amazing lives through the forced suffering and miserable conditions. It's uh, not yeah, forced. Of course it is. It, if it they work for McDonald's, they're going to have no they job. They can work and, somewhere uh, else. But they well, made that choice. Another, another corporation with the same conditions. <laughs> no, they, they can choice. work for a mom and pop shop. They can work for themselves. They can do well, anything mom, that they want. Are you serious? Like, what yes. do you think these people have? Like, because all the, like, okay, you so imagine so... you're... Imagine you live in a village in like um, Southeast Asia, for instance, and all the land has suddenly been bought by a corporation given, you know, by the government, the government, because um, if the government doesn't let U.S. corporations buy up land, then U.S. the U.S. will po- impose sanctions on the nation, as we saw in Ghana, where they had a famine because they wouldn't let the U.S. buy up their land. So anyway, your village, um, you know, the land has been bought up by McDonald's and you can go and work for McDonald's on the land or you can move to the city where you can get a job at a McDonald's factory or a Nike factory or an Adidas factory and you know all the land again is owned by wealthy foreign entities or wealthy entities that are themselves owned by McDonald's and so you're wherever you go you're going to work for one of these corporations and yeah you can say oh well this isn't really fair I want to be earning more but you know you're one worker and everyone else in that situation is going to accept the conditions because it turns out you need money to pay for food and stuff and if you don't accept that job you're going to have nowhere to live nowhere to pay rent no no sorry, no yeah. need for paying rent and not be able to survive like the idea that you can just say to your boss oh you know i want a raise and if you don't pay me fairly i'm going to leave it's just a non that doesn't doesn't happen you can't do that <laughs> yes you can you can't. <laughs> i've you can. done it so yeah, you, can, I literally ask, done it. <laughs> can i ask can i ask um so what what would be the process of you know, people living in slum villages outside of cities in Africa. What would be their process of, you know, becoming self-employed superstar entrepreneurs? How would they do that? Who are you asking me or aircraft? I mean, it, I mean, any to anybody who thinks the oh well, you can just work for yourself or something. You know, is um, a, well, you- I would say in Africa that's not going to happen because that continent is completely terrible i've well, i've yet terrible. to find a good place there I yes i know why it's, it's a, terrible. It's, a it's, horror. Terrible it's terrible because the global capitalist economy has developed it's terrible because they enslave each other and they use rape as a weapon well no that's not why it's terrible it's oh terrible really go to the congo and, okay. and find out i mean I'm, oh it's terrible the congo, the congo go to the sudan Jesus the congo christ the congo i mean I, i'm aware that it's terrible oh. but i'm trying to tell you why it's terrible <laughs> So it's terrible because the global capitalist economy is such has developed as such that uh, countries in the third world are predominantly producing things to be exported to countries like the, the United States. The biggest problem that I've that seen and been to that Africa. Mean, that, mean, that means that they do not produce for their local economy, and that means that their local economy basically goes into ruins. And you know whatever they need is subsidized by. Uh, countries like the United States. So, you know, there was a scandal with uh, Bill Clinton sending, you know, huge, you know, a huge amount of rice to Haiti. And what that's basically doing is that's giving them the things that their local economy needs so that they can keep exporting to the U.S. So, but if they're not actually producing those things themselves and like selling them in local markets, then it doesn't actually benefit their economy. So Um, um, let me just, let me just interject this, please. The problem with Africa is tribalism. Okay. Everywhere you go, it's tribalism. Currently in South Africa, you have different tribes warring with with each other and killing off systematically white people because of apartheid that happened 20, 30 years ago. That is not what I don't know how many times you've been to Africa or even outside the state you live in, pal, but I've been there. I've seen it. It's terrible. You're wrong. Okay. Crack Um, open it. Also, I mean, you can watch the um, seg- or watch the documentary you want. Like that's like not what's happening. Also, to ignore the centuries of colonialism um, that has affected Africa, like you look at the British Empire and what they did. It's across like, Africa, but let me let me ask you: Are you conflating colonialism with uh, capitalism? No, here because okay, colonialism cause <laughs> um, was is and is the tool a tool of which capitalism uses to accrue profit why do you think the empire oh yeah, well profit? i'm what i'm saying is yes you can you can colonialism you can use evolved that. into capitalism 
I mean, well, if anything, no. look at Canada with the HBC, with the Hudson Bay Company. That was pure colonial colonialism that eventually evolved into capitalism. Well, that's what we're saying. Like the colonialism but, is, is, you know, that's a byproduct of the idea of you know seeking to get cap- more with your cap- more capital, point. more control. That's what capitalism is. But These, Britain ceded all their Britain ceded all their territories in Africa. What? what? Sixty but, years ago? That still the, doesn't mean. I mean that, the empire. The empire I mean, can only last so long. The empire does not exist the anymore. The empire still made Britain there's... wealthy at the expense of the you know, rest of the world. Look yes, it did. Happened. It did. Yeah, exactly. That's what we're saying. That's but how long? Africa how long do you is... sit there and go? These people are still suffering under the under the the throes of colonialism when there's generations of people who don't even the, know what the process, happened. Process. Process I just described of like. You know the economies of the third world being sub or subservient to the economies of the Western world in the United States. That's called neo-colonialism, which basically mm. means that even though formal colonialism, in the form of like actual colonies and occupation, well, has here's the thing, point, Piper. There's is... still well, no, let me finish. So there's okay. still there's still like geopolitical and economic subservience that nations in the third world have. To nations in the West, mm. like the United States. Yeah. Well, okay. So there's, but there's other nations that are technically considered third world nations because they, they literally had these governments where they put installed these. They, they're like screw, screw democracy, screw capitalism. We're gonna, we're gonna do things our way. We're gonna, you know, do what we want. And then they failed. And not only do they, some places like, uh, some places like. Uh, you know, like Brazil and Argentina have like the perfect way, the, the like the perfect growing conditions for any crop they could think of. And Venezuela has like the perfect conditions to grow year round. In, in all the, there's should never be anyone starving in Venezuela. Like never the, there's so much, like it's almost impossible not to grow things there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, looking at chat, looking at chat real quick. Logan Stoller, aka Fluffy, my hetero life mate, states people sell their labor for wages because they don't take the risk, they don't take upon the burden of financial risk for the business. That's they could cool. just stop selling outside of Africa, these third world countries could. So, no, well, hold on a second. I don't, I don't even know what that means. Like, what do you mean stop selling outside of Africa? That has nothing to do with my... Okay, problem. well, third world countries in Africa exactly don't have to sell their stuff to outside agencies. If, I mean, yeah, right. they do. Because they have proved a bunch of debt to those, to the, they, to, you know... Number one, it's the legacy of colonialism. So the fact that when the colonial powers invaded those countries originally and established colonies, they were doing the same thing, right? And forcing them to produce for the mother colonial country. And number two, it's the fact that um, because of the economic uh, and geopolitical supremacy of countries like the United States, uh, these third world nations have accrued massive amounts of debts that they owe mm. to you know uh, institutions with, which represent those Western powers like the IMF. And also, so they, they, um, they, they, can't, they, can't subvert, they can't subvert what uh, Western countries want for their economic policy. It's also, structured um, like... Structurally, they just can't do it. Yeah. Um, sorry to uh, say, firstly, um, I want to sort of um, draw this to a conclusion because it's quite late in the UK. Um, but secondly, um, I wanted just to add on to Piper's point. Um, we've already seen what happens when um, African countries start refusing to bow to American capitalism and Amer- American trade standards. Um, and like we, as Piper said, the IMF and the UN, um, they, to cut them off. Like Ghana refused to um, privatize uh, farm previously nationally national, nationally owned land to American corporations. So you know, America boycotted them and like put in powers to um, blacklist Ghana. And a famine happened. We look at African nations, which um, are entirely controlled by um, American corporations in a sense, or their industries are, because if they don't, they're facing economic turmoil and even worse conditions. Like to you know to sit there and say oh well, African countries could just do X Y Z as though it's like a, a free world and not one that's entirely controlled by the capitalist system and thus the rules of the capitalist system is incredibly naive and ignorant of the way the world is. 
really, like to ignore the um, legacy of the British Empire, which went around the world ravaging cultures to further its own profits, and then to say, oh, well, you know, that was uh, ages ago, as though it had no, <laughs> as though it doesn't have any continuing effect today, and isn't part of why capitalism is, is the way it is today, and the way like the world is structured is, you know, ridiculous. India had, you know, manufactured famines to create profit for the UK. Winston Churchill, you know, celebrated as this great war leader, is responsible for some of the biggest atrocities in world history in India, where, you know, he let people starve and made people starve because of their refusal to continue serving um, UK. Like the um, fact that we have such wealth in the West is because of our history of colonialism and capitalism, not because, you know, oh, Africa is, has got this problem with its cultures and stuff, because if you look at um, history, if you look at when Europe was going through the dark, the um, what's called, you know, the dark ages and stuff, and the, um, the medieval period, there was so much happening in, in Africa and in the Middle East and in Latin America, but colonialism came, and colonialism and um, its, you know, predecessor, capitalism has allowed the west to maintain dominance over the rest of the world and to you know pretend that um the west is just inherently better and Af you know africa's got this tribalism and stuff and all these other like lies essentially is just you know flat out wrong and i'm sorry to um sort of say that we should probably draw this to a close but i um feel as though the next few points you want to make try and make them a bit more concise and like um Maybe we can continue the discussion another time because um it is it's approaching four in the morning. <laughs> so. Plus, I've got to like be up tomorrow for a job interview. Well, good luck on your job interview. <laughs> good luck. Work hard. <laughs> good luck, Rose. Yeah. But hey, well, um, uh, for your audience, for those who don't know me, I am Aircraft Sparky. Please check me out on my channel on YouTube on Wednesday nights at eight PM Central U.S. Time Zone. We look at current events, we make fun of things, and we also talk to people. I'm planning to talk with, I actually want to get in touch with Geek and uh, Owen to set up some debates for later. Uh, we'll talk after air. Uh, please follow me on Twitter at Aircraft Sparky and the rest of my information we found on my YouTube channel. Thank you for having me. It's been a brilliant discussion. Great people here. I'd like to thank my host, Owen Wilson. Uh, Owen <laughs> McDonald, Owen sorry. The actor. <laughs> Uh, Owen McDonald for, for allowing me on tonight. It has been great. Thank you so much. Not a problem. It's been great having all of you on. Um, and I hope to do more like this in the future because it's been really uh, great. Um, sorry to end the uh, sort of stream so abruptly. It's just it's quite late here. Um, and I'm quite sorry. Oh, we managed to talk about a lot. Yeah, yeah I was surprised, actually. I mean, I had three power outages during this hangout and, like, one before and two others before. But I managed to, like, jump back in. So, and since uh, Aircraft Frosty for well, Oh no! Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> uh, There's a good picture, though. No, that is no, a good that, picture of it. That would be five power. <laughs> and I and follow me on Twitter too at some random geek with the, the E's and geek being threes. Yeah, uh, please redo that, that geek, because you died <laughs> on us. Heard nothing. I'm sorry. <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> you, can you hear us? No, we didn't hear you at all. Please, please okay. do your spill again. I am some random geek. I do movie reviews. I do video anime reviews. I talk about politics or should start talking about politics. And I also do let's plays. Subscribe to my channel and follow on my Twitter. <laughs> okay. What if I don't want to? <laughs> you can't tell me what to do. Uh, okay. All right. Anyway, I'll link to everyone's like channels and stuff in the uh, description for this stream. Um, I'll share the same when I mirrored this too. Yeah. Uh, and follow American everyone. Anarchists and Sub American Anarchists and follow Piper Social Revolution and Sub no so the Social Revolution on YouTube as well. <laughs> Thank you for plugging me. You're and um, if if I could real quick, uh, I haven't been doing very much on on my channel recently, but I'm a very dead horse. Uh, I'm a very dead horse on Twitter, Good and thing we haven't been beating you. <laughs> 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 that never gets old. Um, <laughs> um, on my channel, what has been going on on my channel is a, another show called The Dump um, that uh, my friend Unknown, Unknown Archive runs on my channel. They watch really crappy TV. Um, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he's been he's been running that on my channel. Uh, we've been um, he's. Uh, 
he just basically uh, gets high and does a sort of mystery science theater 3000 kind of thing. Uh, it's fun for everybody, pretty much. So uh, even 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 people who would disagree with me politically should uh, enjoy. Maybe go subscribe if you want to. Brilliant. Okay. Um, any more uh, chat advertisements? <laughs> well, I do have a Patreon that you can also <laughs> that you can also donate to. Such a capitalist. <laughs> One must survive. I, I need to eat. I yeah, know. No, exactly. It's just funny to me. Sorry. Continue. Anyway, um, it's been a great stream. Um, thanks everyone for coming, and hopefully, um, we'll do another similar one next time. Um, like I like uh, Sparky said, uh, hopefully we'll have some um, individual debates. Um, between um, certain members of the group you see here. Um, That'd be fun. And I hope you all look forward to it. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Right on. Thank you. Yep.